Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here with us to study deep learning for alarm detection. I'm Bo from LinkedIn. My colleagues are Royin, Keshin, Yanrong, Xinwei, Xie Yang, and I will present this tutorial, Deep Learning for Alarm Detection. I hope that you all will enjoy our tutorial. If some of you do not find that's the case, I'm going to show them your alarm list. OK. Let us get started. Here's the agenda for the tutorial. We'll first start with the introduction. Then we go to deep learning for alarm detection. And after that, we will talk about the real application cases, case studies for the deep alarm detection. And finally, we'll do conclusion and the future trends. I will start the introduction. So what is alarmly? By dictionary, alarmly means something that deviates from all is standard, normal, or expected. For example, in this figure, the black swan is deviated from the other white swans. So defining alarmly requires defining three things. Define the expected data pattern. So all is normal. Also need to define a distance function to measure the distance between the two data points. And finally, we need a threshold that uh, defines how far is far enough to be a normally. Then a normally taking algorithms are to learn the rules and the functions to identify anomalies. So we can apply those rules to check the new data points are anomaly or not. So question, can you detect the anomalies with a rule for this uh, data, uh, case with this figure? There may be a different rules Here's one of them. We can define the distance function as third dimension minus product of the first and the second dimension. If this result is more than zero, then the data point is uh, alarming. So this data, this rule is based on a distance function and the threshold which are key components for alarm detection algorithms. We'll talk a lot about this during the tutorial. Now let us take a look at the different applications uh, for alarm detection. So cyber crimes has accounted for the trillions of dollars in losses. As per Juniper research, the month in 2019 last year was two trillion dollars. And the network intrusion is one of the most important network security problem. So most access to a computer networks are expected to be authorized. Unauthorized access are anomalies. Based on the account access log, we can detect those unauthorized access in intrusion detection. So the input data side is a account access lock. Another application of alarm detection is a fraud detection. Fraud detection is applied to many industries, such as banking or insurance. According to the Nielsen report, only credit payment fraud itself, the loss worldwide reached about 30 billion. So in the five, 10 years, this is going to be a rise to 40 billion. So for the uh, fraud detection, uh, the input data will be the user transaction history. Another important application of long detection is in the area of the healthcare and the medical diagnosis. For example, detect the disease are uh, based on the medical images. Given a medical image, 
accurately taking of long parts of the image can help doctors to diagnose tumors and cancers. So here the input data is the image. Another application of long taxing is in the area of the Internet of Things. So IoT heavily depends on long detection. IoT work with a large volume of data from sensor networks and other sources to prevent data from being compromised by attacks or errors. The system needs to apply long detection techniques to evaluate possible incidents as quickly as possible. Otherwise, the whole system may break down. For example, a leaking connection pipe can lead to the shutting down of the entire production line. So here, the input data is streaming sensor data over time. In the security and the video surveillance, the omnitaction was also an important uh, methodology. So video surveillance uh, cameras has been widely deployed in both private and open spaces and districts to capture the oblong scenes, like criminal scenes. Here the input data for alarm text is a video and the image streaming data. Another use case of alarm detection lies more in the realm of the lavity detection. We know that anomalies and the lavity uh, both are out of the distribution data points and their detection leverages the same type of algorithms. Uh, whether you call them anomalies or lavity really just depends on your perspective. Lava detection is very important in the field of the autonomous uh, vehicle development. It is well known that the biggest challenge in developing the fully autonomous vehicle lies in take care of more and more color cases. This includes abnormal road conditions, rare scenarios, and unexpected behaviors of dynamic objects, such as pedestrians and other cars. So here, the input for alarm detection algorithm is streaming data from sensors such as camera, lidar, radar. So from all those application examples, we can see there are various data types for alarm detection besides the common independent data points, image, time series, graph data have dependency in the samples. So various applications, various data types, alarm detection seems a challenge problem. Yes, alarm detection is a challenge problem. This is due to the multiple reasons. First, we cannot take a fully supervised approaches because alarm labels are very sparse and normally done by the human expert manually, which is very costly. And even you have the label, alarmly are very rare. So normal and alarmly data are extremely imbalanced. The second reason is when we identify anomalies, we always try to make use of all the available information, which cause high dimensional data. Third one, the definition of anomaly really varies from application to applications. It is difficult to find the algorithms suitable to a wider range of applications. And the last, the boundary between alarm and anomalies is often not precise and difficult to learn. To address those challenges, in the literature, there are three main categories of alarm detection algorithms that have been developed. Here is a quick view of traditional alarm detection algorithms. First type is a classification-based algorithm. You can either do multi-classification if you have labels. You can also do the one-class classification, like one-class SVM. Second category is a distance-based approach. So we define a distance measure 
to separate the LOM and OBLOM data. Uh, there are some subcategories. You can do nearest labor distance based approach. You can also do clustering based approach. Basically, you measure distance to the cluster uh, which your data points belongs to. You can also do projection based approach. And then you measure distance, you find a no dimensional space. The third category of approach is uh, statistical models. So statics models are shown the normal data occur in the high probability regions of a statistic, uh, stochastic model, which can be parametric, like a Gaussian mixture model or regression-based model like ARIMA, which can also be long parametric, like the approach based on the kernel density estimator. Let us take a look at the, how we formulate the alarm detection algorithm. So first, we can learn a data representation. And the second, based on the representation, we detect an anomaly. So the first step on learn data representation, basically we try to learn a mapping function, can mapping the input data to a unified space. It can be a predefined space, which we know the meaning of the space, which also can be a latent space. We're not sure about the physical meaning about space. And after we have this mapping, we need to uh, learn the Lomley score. So we need to define a Lomley measure, uh, something like a distance function in this universe space. It could be in a predefined space. It can be also in a latent space. And after that, we need to have a, a decision threshold. We compare the Lomley score, uh, score we obtain uh, with this threshold. Normally, if this one is bigger than the uh, threshold, it's a long, uh, otherwise it's a long data points. Sometimes it could be less than the data, depends how you define the distance. So you can see, we need to do the model uh, to learn the theta for the mapping function. We also have parameter for the normally distance function, eta and the threshold delta. And I have a different type based on how we a formulated the algorithm. It could be long parameter. Then no need to learn a theta, eta, or delta. Yeah. Like some distance based function. We could we'll talk about the more details later. It could be one phase. We only learn either theta or eta or data. Then one phase is done. Yeah. It could be two phases. We first learn the theta and we learn the eta and delta. Uh, we number it separate. It could be also integrated. We do have a two phase, but we learn together, uh, theta, eta, data. Mm. Also, we can um, category to a different way based on the lay, what, if we have label or not. If we don't have any uh, anomaly labels, and it will be unsurprised approach, no label information. Yeah. And for uh, then we, the delta is predefined and the neural with eta, right? If we have some label, right? Uh, then we maybe do the semi surprise. Uh, so we learn the uh, data. Uh, the label can either use for a model estimation. Uh, also, the threshold the delta can be fine tuned, use this labeling data. Let's take a look at some examples, right? Uh, this one class is where belongs to the one class uh, classification approach. For a traditional SVM, we try to learn the hyperplane separate the uh, two classes. For the one class SVM, we learn the uh, hyperplane uh, separate the uh, data points with the origin. So uh, when the data points uh, it's out of hyperplan, far away from origin, they are normal. Otherwise, when they get close to the origin, then they are the outliers, they are the anomalies. So here, the mapping function will be the kernel function to mapping data points uh, in the uh, space, a unified space. And the longest score is based on distance to the origin which is a product of the W, right? Which is the uh, mapping function phi x. Yeah. 
and we'll have a threshold around. Uh, if this distance is less than the round, uh, it's a long way, otherwise it's not. And this objective function, we can learn its parameters. We can see this approach is unsupervised because we don't need any alarming labels. And also this approach is integrated because we so optimizing the one objective function, we learn all the parameters. Let's take a look at another example, uh, support vector data description, SVDD. It's also the one class classification approach. So here, we try to find the smallest hypersphere with center radius. If the data points outside of this hypersphere, that's a normally. If inside the hypersphere, there are normal data points. So again, mapping function will be the curl function, uh, mapping the data points into this uh, uh, space. And the normal score based on the distance to the hypersphere center. Yeah. If this uh, distance is bigger than the radius of the hypersphere, it's a long way. Other one is a long data point. So you can see this one is also the unsurprised approach because we don't have any alarming labels here. It's also integrated approach because we optimize this uh, SVDD objective function, estimate all the parameter together in one phase, yeah. Another example uh, from the distance-based approach, uh, especially based on the Kinnear's labor. Yeah. So the idea is we first uh, uh, define the local distance for a given data point A. Yeah. So local distance for data point A basically is average distance between these data points with these labels. That's called local distance. Yeah. So we don't have mapping function because we directly calculate distance in the original space. Yeah. So normal score is the local outlier factor, uh, LOF, which is defined as the local distance with data point A uh, divided by the average local distance from its labors. And if this LAF is bigger than one, then it's a long way. Yeah. Otherwise, it's a long data point. When the LAF is bigger than one, basically means uh, this data point, uh, the distance, uh, it's far away from the average distance with its labors. Yeah. So this is a distance based approach, which is also unsurprised because we don't need any. Uh, alarming labels, and also it's a long parametric. We just use the label who to calculate distance. It's an example, you see how you find the alarms. And let's look at the example about the uh, statistical models. Uh, for example, dynamic linear model. So here, uh, at time t, uh, the value yt depend on the uh, all the historical uh, value, right? from y1 to 1t less mi. So here the mapping function is uh, mapping the data points uh, based on all the historical data and uh, to a predefined space, which basically the space, you predict the current value. And the long score based on the prediction error. So the prediction the current value the difference between the prediction value and the actual observable value, that's the only score, right? So if this uh, alarm score is bigger than threshold delta, then the data points is anomaly. Otherwise, it's not. So the data can come from test statistics or fine tune with alarm labels if we have the alarm labels. So this one could be unsupervised if we don't have any uh, alarm labels. It could be semi surprised like you have some alarming labels used to tune the threshold. And also, this is a two phase approach. Because first, we learn a mapping function. Yeah. And after, we do the alarming score estimation and the threshold. Now, after those examples, let's uh, 
do some comparison uh, among those uh, different traditional algorithms. For the classification approaches, the good thing is it's, the testing is fast, it's just scoring based on your function. And it can be accurate if you do have some labels, you can really separate the uh, long data point with the outliers in the training data, but they also have some cons. For a multi-class classification, basically we, you need the uh, abnormal labels, which is very costly, not easy to get. But if you use one class, you don't need the uh, anomaly labels, but you need to carefully choose your hyperparameters. And the second uh, uh, category, distance-based approach. For the nearest labor-based, uh, so uh, the advantage is we do uh, need the labels. Also, there's no assumption about data distributions. But the testing, it's uh, costly. Yeah. Requires the high con highly computation. Yeah. Also, do not uh, work well for the high dimensional data. Yeah. Because in high dimensional data, basically, there are not uh, much differentiation power based on distance function. Yeah. Also, uh, the approach is sensitive to the number of the labels, the hyperparameters. For a classroom based uh, approach, testing is fast because you're only against the cluster centers. But the training can be expensive. Basically, you gotta do the whole clustering algorithm. Also, it's not easy for high dimensional data. Also, sensitive to what kind of the distant function you try, you, know, you, you pick up. For the projection based approach, it can handle high dimensional data because you do the projection into the low dimensional data. But uh, the cons is it's hard to interpret the alarm. For statistical models, if we use prime trick models, uh, we do not require the labels. Uh, also, you can handle the sequence or special data well. But it, you really need to make sure your underlying distribution assumption actually close to the uh, real data. Also, the choice of test statistics also debatable. If we use a long prime trick uh, statistics model, uh, also, we also do not need the labels, uh, but it's difficult to handle high dimensional data. Uh, because it's difficult to do the high dimensional data in the kernel density estimation high dimensional data. So we can see, uh, based on all those challenges, we also have opportunities. We really need to find the new approaches, right? Can learn better nonlinear and hierarchical discriminated features from data. Also, one of the new algorithms, right, can capture the complex and high dimensional data structure. Also, uh, we want to find the new approach can, uh, as a ge generic model architecture, as suitable for different data types. Also, we want to also handle the uh, sparse label issue as uh, well. So all those uh, challenges actually calling uh, for the new approaches, where the deep learning actually can really help address those challenges. Yeah. So next, I'm going to switch to my colleague, because she talked about the deep learning for alarm detection. Okay, let's uh, yield to Bo. Uh, if anybody has question, you can ask now, and Bo will be hosting this Q and A session. Yeah, thanks, Roy. Yeah, so basically, after each section, we uh, allocate a little bit of time so we can answer question, maybe specifically for that section. But feel free, uh, even during the talk, you can post your question on the chat, uh, so we can pick up there. Uh, Okay, I see a comment, so, so we need to get close to Mike. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll adjust the volume a little bit from our side, uh, Roy. Yeah. 
uh, does the video sounds good or the the mic is talking about uh, our oh, time? The, oh, you mean uh, why is it talking now? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I see some question like any of the methods talks being used in pro production for now. Uh, Maybe I can answer the question. Uh, actually, we have a section about the application at LinkedIn and there you would see uh, what are the algorithms we have been used at LinkedIn. Yeah, yes. As uh, Roy mentioned, we will have the section uh, talk mm -hmm. about details about what kind of model we use at LinkedIn. Uh, at LinkedIn, we used to use the uh, statistic models, but now we are moving to the deep learning based models. Yeah. And I see another question asking um, on projection based anomaly detection, why is it hard to interpret the anomaly? Uh, what do you want to answer it? Uh, uh, yes, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, in terms of interpretation, because after you do the uh, projection, right, the data points uh, in a new uh, low dimension space. Uh, so uh, you're in that space, uh, uh, you can, uh, it's difficult to understand the meaning of dimensions. That's why even you see some points is far away, it's hard to see because what kind of physical meaning they are far away, right? This kind of like when you do deep learning model after uh, a lot of layers, you mapping data points to another layer, and it's difficult to you do some interpretation in a new space. Yeah. For example, if we do the original space, uh, suppose you have some feature, you know it's uh, maybe a, uh, it's gender, it's height, uh, it's weight, all those meaning, you can either see why a data point is anomaly because maybe his weight is too high uh, or his uh, age is too high, right? But if you map it to a new space, right? Uh, and it's hard to interpret why these data points are far away from others. Yeah. But there, of course, there's still something you can try, uh, like uh, do interpretation mapping back, but it's uh, more challenging than you know, original space. Okay, the, uh, the next question, when you're talking about the forecasting statistical based methods, what anomaly score function did you use? Was it like an effect size or probability of anomaly, CDF? Yeah, I think that it depends uh, on the specific uh, algorithm because that's a big category right? when we talk about such uh, models. But, the, uh, but uh, in general, uh, the score will be uh, like you mentioned, it's gonna be like the probability because basically we'll show the, uh, the long data points should exist in the high density, high probability area. Uh, otherwise, <coughs> like, it's abnormal because you, it's, that means you with no probability you can uh, even exist in the uh, data, uh, in the sample, yeah. Okay, and, and the next question, do you see combinations of these basic methods used? For example, a projection method to reduce dimensionality plus a clustering method on the projected data? Yeah, this is a very good question. Yes, it is, yeah. So like we mentioned, right? So we will do clustering and do all those details based on method. It all have this cursor dimensionality, right? High dimension space doesn't work well. So if you do the projection first, uh, we remove the noise, mapping data to a low dimension space, and do clustering or do distance, uh, actually it works better. Uh, you are right. These two uh, projects actually, yeah. uh, they are combined together in practice. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, due to the time limits, we will answer one last question. Uh, so I see two questions. Uh, one is, what is the difference between unified space and latent space? And the second is, what is the predefined space? Could you give an example? Um, so we will first answer these questions and then enter to the next part. Okay, 
yeah, the, this is also a good point. I think this is, uh, uh, when we use these two terms, it's uh, really about uh, we want to see, uh, when we do mapping function, uh, we'll have two situations, right? Why situation is uh, uh, you just mapping uh, the original oh, data point to a latent space, to a latent space, uh, which, which actually, uh, so, which actually means when you do this, uh, you are doing the traditional low dimensional projection. Okay. Uh, so, can you help me mute others? Oh, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, then we can do it several. If someone wants to speak, they can just ask on mute. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, I will uh, continue answering questions. So why is uh, latent space? That's easy to understand because traditionally we, we either do this uh, PCA or do deep learning, you map into a new space uh, uh, to make the data uh, more separable, right? Easy to do the uh, next step. Yeah, predefined basically means, basically mean the prediction. Now, uh, let me give example. So when we do this time series uh, uh, alarm detection, now one way is you base on all the historical data, right? It's a time series. You try to predict the current value. Uh, uh, and then you use the current value compared with your actual observed value. Then you identify it's long data. But when you do this prediction, we treat it as you mapping the data points, the whole time series to a predefined pre space. Basically, you mapping the whole any data points like total time series before this current value into the current value. You try to predict the current value. So that's just a term we say the prediction. Now that's what we mean by the predefined space because we know what that space exactly mean. For example, we know this space means you're gonna predict the value, uh, current value, uh, which, which has a physical meaning, we know it. Okay, th thanks, Bo, uh, Bo, for answering the question. We will uh, enter the next section and you can keep asking questions in the chat. Thanks, Bo, for giving us the broad introduction of anomaly detection and the traditional algorithms. I am Kexin from the same team. Now, let's take a look of how deep learning is used for anomaly detection. Within this section, we're gonna introduce you three topics. First, we talk about uh, basic building blocks. Secondly, we introduce you the popular deep structures for anomaly detection. And lastly, we introduce you how we're dealing with uh, sparse labels um, using deep techniques for anomaly detection. Okay, basic building blocks. Uh, within this section, we mainly introduce you three main models. Firstly, talk about uh, multilayer perception. Secondly, convolution neural networks. And third, recurrent neural networks. So multilayer perception is a neural network structure that learns nonlinear and hierarchical feature embeddings from multidimensional data. Each of its layer takes a linear combination of the previous input and then apply nonlinear activation functions, such as uh, sigmoid, ReLU, and TNH. It is also flexible enough that people usually stacking the multi-layers together to learn the hierarchical data relationships. And this is an example where MLP is employed to extract complex feature embeddings and further example with KN for anomaly detection. Um, recall that uh, KN is a non-parametric method to draw boundaries given data distribution. The boundaries are decided on the case nearest neighbors. As uh, the KN methods may suffer from curse of dimensionality issues for high dimensional data, uh, at 2017, Song's group proposed a two-stage model by combining MLP and KN for anomaly detection. Within the architecture that they proposed, an MLP, or more concisely, an autoencoder is being trained on the training data set to extract the intrinsic feature embeddings to reduce dimension. Um, we will talk about autoencoder later, but we'll just give a brief here that autoencoder is being, sometimes it's being used for, um, 
for dimension reduction if the input has a, a high level um, dimensional spaces for the features. Um, and also, after the dimensional reduction, uh, they further sample the length embeddings from the latent space and compute the nearest neighbors on each subset to save the training data training time. And uh, each learned KN on a subset becomes a normally detector uh, here. Each uh, KN is being learned, and uh, each, um, each, each KN is being learned on a subset, and each KN becomes an anomaly detector. And uh, for each sample, its anomaly score is the average distances within each KN. Um, the decision threshold for the anomaly is decided upon normal instances. And uh, overall, this is an unsupervised, non-parametric model uh, with the MLP or autoencoder pre-trained. CN is a network structure that takes advantage of the hierarchical pattern within data and assemble more complex patterns using smaller and simple patterns. It is not only being used for image, actually, um, but also for sequential data, where it captures the spatial and temporal dependencies which outperforms MLP. Take an, um, take an, take an image, for example. For example, here you have uh, three channels, RGB, and uh, the convolutional operation strides over the channels and extracts high-level features from adjacent pixels. And the polling layer is then responsible to reduce the spatial size of the convolute features. This is also help to extract dominant features. Overall, CN is good at reducing complicated data relationships to easier process uh, without losing critical features to getting a good prediction. And here we introduce you an example of using CN for anomaly detection. This example actually utilizes CN to detect the defect areas on the surface as an application for anomaly detection. And the picture on the left hand side here um, reveals a micro view of the surface of a material. Uh, and on this um, orange box here, um, it highlights a defect segment here. Um, the task here is to output whether the segment has defects or not. The model proposed by Hazelman um, at the 2018 that they proposed a CN based solution given a mask area x dash a, uh, where they can denote this area as x dash a, and uh, they train a CN model to predict uh, the defect free look of x, and this can be denoted as uh, x a. And uh, the anomaly score for the defected area is computed as the absolute difference of the mask area and its prediction. The decision threshold um, is, is being picked through the partial labels through precision recall um, within the validation data set. And overall, this is a semi-supervised learning. Um, and uh, since both parameters and threshold are being learned, this is a two-phase model. So far, we introduced you the most layer perception, CN. Uh, and now we introduce you also another popular building block, uh, recurrent neural networks. RN is uh, recurrent in natural as it performs the same function for every input of the data, while the output of the current input depends on the past one computation. And its activation function can be as simple as sigmoid, 10 edge. And the LSTM or GRU are modified version of recurrent neural networks, uh, which makes it easier to remember past data in memory. Um, the gating mechanism together within the self-contained memory cell within LSTM or GRU um, enables the network to capture the nonlinear long-term temporal dependencies in a sequence. Okay, we're gonna introduce you another example of uh, utilizing LSTM or RN for multivariate time series detection. Um, and this structure is proposed by Mohachio at uh, 2015. And they argue that uh, by stacking up the recurrent hidden layers would uh, help learn the higher level temporal features. 
and the architecture provided, pro, pro, provided by them uses uh, the stacked uh, LSTM layers as the mapping function to predict m number of time series jointly for the future time steps. Within the stacked LSTM layers, um, each unit in the lower LSTM layer is fully connected to each unit in the LSTM hidden layer above it through, through a feed forward connections. Um, the architecture is optimized based on normal data. And the anomaly score are computed based on the prediction error. The error vectors are, mod are modeled to be a multivariate Gaussian distribution where the mu and tau are computed using the maximum likelihood estimation. And decision threshold tau is based on precision recall within the validation data set. And overall, this is a semi-supervised two-phase learning structure. In terms of evaluation, they reported precision recall and uh, F score on the three real world data, site, data sets. Um, they also compared RN and LSTM structure um, based on their study, the OSTM outperformed RN across the board. So far, we have introduced you the three basic building blocks, including um, LMP, CN, and RN. Here are several takeaways. First, um, we see that the models such as the LMP and CN and RN can better capture data representation, especially CN and RN that are good for capturing the data spatial and temporal dependencies. Also, we have introduced a bunch of examples that uh, CN, MLP, and RN are being used as mapping functions for the other D models or uh, the traditional models um, as, um, as to extract the features, like as, as to extract more advanced features. So uh, now I'm going to introduce you the popular deep structures for anomaly detection. Here, uh, we first introduce you the deep one class model. Recall that uh, the one class classification um, maps the input to latent space using kernel function. And, uh, um, and it's able to um, learn the hyperplane or hypersphere to separate the abnormal classes. The deep SVDD proposed by Roth 2018 directly replaced the kernel function to one class to be a neural network. His idea is that uh, the neural nets can serve a transformation function to map input space X to an output space F, here from X to F, and where most of the data represented, represented by the network can then be clustered into a hyperplane or hypersphere characteristic by center C and the radius R with the minimum volume. Um, they expect the normal, the normal samples should fall within the hypersphere and the abnormal samples should fall outside. And in their objective, they also like, deliberately added a weight decay regularizer here um, to avoid overfitting. And overall, since um, the parameters and also the anomaly cutoffs are all being learned within the same model, this is an unsupervised and integrated model. Roth's group compares their proposed deep one class with the traditional, tra traditional methods on two benchmark data sets. Um, these two data sets are quite, 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 quite popular. One is called MINST and the other is called uh, CIFAR, where actually CIFAR consists of more complicated classes and complicated features. And uh, from their outputs, and they find out SVDD, um, that the clear outperforms both its shallow and deep com com competitors on means data set. Um, but on CIFAR here, uh, the results are quite mixed. Now I'm going to introduce you the other structure called autoencoder. So autoencoders are, un are unsupervised learning technique in which we leverage uh, the neural networks for the task of representation learning. Specifically, autoencoder um, that they impose a bottleneck in the network, which actually forces uh, the network to learn the compressed knowledge from the data. And this is achieved by learning an encoder F 
and the decoder G jointly, where the input X is being mapped to a latent and lower space, lower, lower dimensional space Z, and then mapped back to X. Uh, and uh, F and G are learned jointly by minimizing the reconstruction error. Um, so note here, actually, the learning task of autoencoder is a, a little bit different. Here, autoencoder is trying to reconstruct other than predict. So um, sh the autoencoder should actually see all of the input as the samples and also their predictions. And where it maps back to the original space and uh, this process, no new prediction is being generated. Um, so, um, how to use autoencoder for anomaly detection, actually? Um, the intuition here is that uh, when autoencoder is being trained based on normal data, um, they should be able to compress and learn the majority behavior of the data. So, um, if some data or some samples, they cannot reconstruct it by the autoencoder, that samples are more likely to be outlier or anomaly. So here we give the formulation of autoencoder being used for anomaly detection. The mapping function um, is the encoder and the decoder, F and G. And the anomaly score are usually the reconstruction errors. The decision structure tau is also decided upon normal data usually, or being fine-tuned by precision recall from like, the validation label data, the, the validation data labels. And overall, um, we have seen literatures that all encoder is being, in a, being used in an unsupervised way or semi-supervised way. And this is a two-phase model. Also, like people in the industry, um, are quite like, usual to make analogy between autoencoder and the PCA. Um, we actually will be able to know like autoencoder is actually with linear activation behaves similar to PCA, um, where where actually the nonlinear uh, with autoencoder with nonlinear activations is able to capture the data's nonlinearities. The data on the left hand side here provides um, the later representation learned by the PCA and a linear autoencoder, you can see here and here. Um, by comparing the two graphs, we see uh, that they actually are learning similar latent values using the same data. Um, however, if we introduce nonlinearities into autoencoder using the same data, uh, we can see that um, this the, the projection to the latent space actually can separate the three classes even better. And just using one dimensional representation learned by this nonlinear autoencoder, this is already being able to separate the three classes. Now we conclude some pros and cons between PCA and autoencoder. Um, basically, PCA is a, not, is a linear linear method and um, it's uh, will have the unit so unique solutions through singular value decomposition so this is its pro and for cons as i mentioned this is uh, just a for linear transformation so it is a little bit limited to learn the feature representation uh, as for autoencoder um, it is quite easy to capture the complex patterns through nonlinearities and uh, setting uh, stacking up structures um, but for cons uh, we also see a lot of see if there without without uh, additional constraints, autoencoder may learn an identity mapping of the inputs. So it's quite quite easily to get overfitted. So as I mentioned, the overfitting problem of uh, of autoencoder. So how to avoid autoencoder auto encoder to get overfitted by the input data? Um, the ideal autoencoder model should be sensitive enough to the inputs to accurately build up reconstruction. And it should also be insensitive enough to the inputs that the model doesn't simply memorize or overfit the training data so that it will be able to just learn the normal or majority characteristics of the data. And to achieve this trade-off, there are a couple of variants of the encoder that uses the following as the training objective. Basically, uh, with the reconstruction with the reconstruction arrow and also adding another regularizer here to avoid the, the model to get to get overfitted. So we will give you several examples talk about all the encoder vari variants that uh, is following this format and uh, successfully avoid all the encoder to get overfitted. 
the first example we introduce is called sparse or encoder. Um, so for this model, the motivation behind SAE is that uh, fewer hidden nodes may not be enough to learn a complex data structure. Instead, allowing like more hidden nodes should be able to capture the joint data distribution where most of them are independent or structured. A uh, sparse autoencoder is actually um, elim like eliminates the constraint that hidden nodes should should be smaller than the input data dimension. For example, like see this example here. Though we have the inputs as five dimensions, we actually can expand the network and let the latent space to be even larger than the input dimension. Um, and this actually will definitely learn a identity function a identity ma mapping if um, there is no constraint on the network so uh, SAE here added uh, two two ways to impose the sparse constraints as regularizers to avoid the auto encoder to get overfitted the first way is uh, by using L1 regularization here um, and this one like that tends to shrink the coefficients to be zero. And here, AI here are the indicators whether a node is being activated or not. A second way uh, is uh, using KL divergence. Um, so we can think of like whether a node is being activated, um, think this as, an, as a Bernoulli variable. And uh, this KL divergence is trying to, trying to minimize the distance between the preset, the, distribution of uh, whether that uh, whether that uh, um, hidden nodes is being activated or not and also to the observed uh, um, average of the hidden nodes activations basically you can preset a row and then there is uh, the average uh, um, average uh, row of uh, denoting that uh, in average whether these nodes is being activated across the training data so KL divergence is being used here to measure the differences between expectation and also the observations. Um, in this way, if we preset our role uh, to be a smaller value as close to zero, um, this one tends to penalize the activated average activated um, units here to be also almost to zero. So here, um, the, the, the penalization is being achieved. Um, and uh, here's an example, actually. Um, this, is a, 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 this is a learned auto, sparse autoencoder on top of uh, uh, some, like, some training data sets. And these are like 100 examples of the hidden units uh, like, plotted on, over what is learned. And we can see that um, each figure here show that one unit that maxima being maximax, maximally like activated one of the hidden units in the latent space. Basically, we see that the, the different hidden units have learned to detect uh, different edge positions and orientations in that image. Uh, and, um, and we see that by spreading out the, the network and each hidden unit is able to learn a different representation. And uh, this, this actually, these representations will be quite useful for any future like vision tasks. The other variant I'm going to introduce you is uh, called a denoising autoencoder. Um, basically, denoising autoencoder is just to try to corrupting the input data X on purpose um, by randomly turning some of the inputs uh, here X to be zero, and then it becomes uh, it becomes X star. And they are actually trying to use uh, the, 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 the denoising values of X in, like to be X star and to fit into a network and learn a network. Um, when calculating the loss function, it is important to compare the output value uh, of X with the original input X, actually not to comparing the output X with, uh, uh, with, with X star, which is, which, is, which, is the learned, which is the data used for learning the, the network. Um, so, um, just to give a summary, that uh, the noisy autoencoder first it corrupted the input X into a noisy version. Like see here, it uh, maps X to an X star, and then um, gives the model a chance to in expose a more complex model data space, and then compute the anomaly score based on the uh, input and the reconstruction. 
And also, decision threshold tau is being decided based on the normal data or label data by precision and, uh, precision and recall. So far, we have introduced you two uh, versions of regularized autoencoders called uh, sparse autoencoder and denoising autoencoder. And uh, however, um, autoencoder and the regularized autoencoders do require normal data passed in for training, um, as labels may not be available. If anomaly data include, uh, included in the training, it may impact autoencoder's performance. Now I will introduce you robust autoencoder um, that eliminates the, the like it, it will also still take in the like noisy data which contain outliers and noise uh, within the training data, but it, it still can fit the the uh, autoencoder model for anomaly detection. So let's uh, go ahead to see its details. So robust deep autoencoder is inspired by robust PCA, uh, which splits the data matrix X into a lower rank matrix L and the sparse matrix S. L and S can be learned by minimizing the sum of singular values within L and uh, penalizing S by pushing S to be zero using L and norm. And this is under the constraint of the sum of L and S uh, to be equal to X uh, under the Fobinian's norm. And um, um, RDA here tries to represent X into um, LD and S, where LD is uh, well represented by the autoencoder model, and S is the element-wise outlier that are difficult to reconstruct. S can be interpreted as the residual uh, matrix. For each iteration updating LD, um, the residuals will be removed from the training so that anomaly data will be automatically retained within S after being trained. Joe applies the LD, RDA for outlier detection by uh, normal classes with digit four and uh, randomly picking up some abnormal classes with different numbers. Um, and uh, with L1 penalization operates on S, um, RDA will be able to capture the unstructured noise and outliers. Also, they use a lambda value to Comp like to control how much regularization is being added to the objective. And uh, we see that, uh, um, that when our, our lambda increases from small to large, the amount of anomaly images diminishes. They also compare the best selected uh, lambda RDA results with isolation forest. Uh, they see that uh, uh, RDA is, is beating isolation forest in terms of one score by 70%. So by now we have introduced you several variants of autoencoder. At the same time, autoencoder can be easily extended um, to different applications such as a non-mutation on the image, um, video surveillance, streaming data, outlier detection. Um, this can be achieved simply by switching its building blocks to MLP, CN, LSTM, GRU, like these are gen like RN like units. So here, we're gonna introduce you several examples of how our, our encoder uh, with like different building block setup to tackle the real world examples. The first application we're gonna introduce you is uh, time series monitoring. Uh, this model proposed by Mahatra 2016, like they leverage the LSTM autoencoder for time series monitoring. Uh, within this example, that the, ma the mapping functions are LSTM layers, um, and they, these are performed as a uh, encoder and decoder. The anomaly score uh, are the reconstruction or prediction arrows um, from the network over the normal, like this network is being trained on normal and uh, the reconstructions could be like, um, if, some, uh, if, if some anomalies occur, then the, uh, the reconstruction or anomaly score will be pretty high. The threshold tau is being decided based on uh, also the pre-learned, uh, like they also model the, uh, the, the reconstruction error into a Gaussian distribution. And also the d decision threshold tau is being fine tuned by precision recall from the validation data set. So overall, this is semi-supervised two-phase uh, learning structure. 
And the graph on the left hand side here shows the reconstruction when abnormal sequences happen. See here in the red highlighted region uh, that when the original matrix has, uh, has the anomaly happen, the reconstruction error or anomaly score tends to grow larger. So this is where the anomalies will be, identi will be identified. Um, like to extend the previous model to a high dimensional problem, like to monitoring a high dimensional like a time series over time. Um, like there are several literatures where people have been doing a study to see if the previous architecture can be extended to high dimensional time series. Um, basically, um, basically, their conclusion is that the previous RM-based autoencoder hasn't been like fully tested to high dimensional time series over like two to twenty. Um, and uh, at two thousand sixteen, Philo Philonos like they explored that uh, nineteen sensors, um, but of using that model, but only ended up building the models for two sen for six sensors jointly. And the 2018 Hutman like forces each input sensor to be independent and then employed the RN structure. Uh, and you can see like in real world, um, high dimensional time series monitoring is a uh, quite common C. And uh, if we putting up like different sensors together, like this sensors emitted time series data and uh, the, the, the metrics between each other can be like heavily correlated or less correlated. So um, at the 2018 Go Gohunusu, like they proposed our like advanced structure to um, extend the, the RN encoder decoder structure to tackle the high dimensional problem. Um, what they do is that uh, um, they, they use the input of the time series, high dimensional time series, but pass over to uh, uh, reduce the dimensional point via feed forward dimension reduction layer, and then um, they uh, and then use the, the time series in reduce the dimension space to reconstruct the, the original high dimensional data via LSTM autoencoder. So, in detail, um, their mapping function maps x to y using a sparse connection here. Um, a, sparse con a sparsely constraint on the weights um, of this feedforward layer is being introduced. And in this way, each unit in the feedforward layer has access to a subset of the input dimensions. Same with the previous OSTM autoencoder method, the anomaly score is being decided based on the reconstruction error. And the decision threshold tau is also being like, uh, like we are being used from the Gaussian distribution of the reconstruction arrow, and tau is being fine-tuned by a precision recall. Um, and as for evaluation, they applied the OSTM autoencoder model, which is the previous original um, architecture, and then um, they in, uh, like just uh, use, utilize the forward autoencoder and uh, spread what is um, based on as, as their proposal model. Uh, and, and they apply to th three time series, real world time series data sets. And here, uh, turbo machinery is the high dimensional time series data sets. Um, as you see here, um, P4 auto encoder um, performs well for low dimensional cases here. Um, spread performs much better um, compared to P4 auto encoder uh, highlighting the regularized effects of the of the sparse connections. And one last example that I'm gonna introduce you uh, is using autoencoder for video surveillance. Here, the task is to detect abnormal frames within a video. For example, um, for um, most of the video clips are working pedestrians, and if some of the frames within people are running or behaving abnormally, um, that uh, we want to detect. At 2018, um, Ribeiro, um, that they proposed our architecture, leveraging CN for this task. Uh, with certain, certain preprocessing within the frames, 
um, the CEAE approach takes in X as the Cubio's 3D structure with different numbers of channels ejected from the video clips. Um, their encoder consists of a three convolutional layer and two pooling layer. And symmetrically, the decoder consists of three deconvolutional layers and two unpooling um, layers to reconstruct the frames back. Um, basically, their abnormal score is uh, being computed as a regularized rolling window for reconstruction arrow. And their decision threshold tau is being decided upon normal frames. And back to the example, um, the black line is the regularized rolling window reconstruction arrow. Uh, and uh, if this arrow tends to going tends to like going up high, um, this is indicating the arrow will be. Um, this is indicating that uh, um, there is some abnormal scene that is um, that is happening over the frame. Okay, uh, so that's Kaixin's part on uh, autoencoder and deep SVVD. Uh, so we open the floor for Q&A and Kaixin is online to answer the questions real time. You can unmute yourself or ask questions in the chat. Kristen, are, are there unanswered questions you want to clarify? Maybe you can. I see one that here mm -hmm. say, uh, what's the typical number of the hidden layers in your typical autoencoder? Um, so that actually depends on the task. Uh, so um, basically, based also based on what type of hidden units you choose, uh, and also what's the type of your task it is. Uh, and uh, from our practice, uh, uh, as we link, as we are linking, mainly focus on non-mutation on time series. Uh, we do not try to expand the network to be too much over the over the limited feature inputs. Um, and say, if your feature input is considering, like, say, hundreds of feature dimensions, and uh, the practical way here that we do is to reduce it to multi layers, and then each layer we can think about as, uh, say, um, like. Um, 36 at the first layer and then 16 in the second layer and then reduce to like say four or two in the middle layer. So that is the, some combinations that we do. But yeah, really it depends on like how, how, how high is your feature dimensions input and also how, what's your task. Yeah. Oh, has there been any research that uses for robust version of R and all encoder for an non um, so by robots, you mean the robots autoencoder um, for that one? So yeah, there is a lot of, um, so there's a lot of research talking about uh, the, the autoencoders and leveraging RN, um, but we haven't seen like quite actively researching over using a robust autoencoder, but leveraging the, the RN structure, not, not yet. Um, thus the autoencoder mentioned implicitly assumes there is some kind of regularity pattern in the sample. Um, looking at uh, looking at slide 1828, uh, let me pull it out. Okay. Uh, so uh, that appears to be a very simple problem since there's a distinct pattern in the image. The question is what happens that uh, regularly or pattern is in high dimensional latent space uh, that not in the original input data. Um, um, basic that uh, model talks about uh, how to use the um, basic uh, CN structure to re reconstruct the like reconstruct the normal material shape. And in this case, basically just using CN to extract the the kind of temporal features, uh, and then using uh, basically, it's over also training over the normal samples, and then it's it's try to like reconstruct uh, the material shape. Um, while when whenever there is uh, like like defect surface on the material, yeah, it's leveraging CN to to compute to to extract the like the, the temporal information for the normal samples. 
Um, is there any hardware compatibility challenges when deploying? Um, so basic that is actually a common. Uh, so that I can like say what is the question? Uh, the question here is that uh, is there any hardware uh, capability challenges that when deploying autoencoder based anomaly section? Um, so I think this is a more like a common problem among like when we deploying the deep learning, deep learning models to the production. Um, yeah, there is some hard, uh, there's some like challenges, um, but not yet. Um, it could be like also a hardware, hardware limit or also um, say like it, you, can de you can decompose this problem into the training and the deployment. Basically when training, you need more GPUs to compute the data to compute the model and also when deployment you need some like machine capability to support such models when it's running online um yeah so there is some like more like challenging over the hardware if we are thinking about to upgrade our uh, upgrade our model from statistical model to um uh, 2d models uh, okay so there's another question that i see uh, when you have additional data say normal samples how much can you reuse, you reuse existing anomaly detection? Do you have to retrain from scratch each time, um, particularly for near network models? Um, yeah, also I think that's another question um, also depend on how frequent your data distribution shifts. Um, so basically we do not expect to train a model that frequent um, since if the model has seen like a lot of scenarios of the normal data, it should be able to reconstruct also the normal behaviors, even if some for some data that fall in say the original distribution, but not not seen yet. Um, but say if it, to some extreme case when your data has a drastic data distribution change, we recommend you to retrain a model to use the most recent data because your model will be able to perform on its right now the normal state other than the previous normal stage. Um, so in our practice, we do, do we do retrain, and the retraining cadence over our experiment example is usually say um, quarterly or like say each uh, each two to three three months, uh, so that we are guaranteeing that uh, our data um, our model is aligned with the data distribution. Yeah, so it so needs retrain. Due yeah. to the time limits, uh, we will and go to the next part, and we will keep answering question in the chat. Now we turn to another popular deep structure, the generative models, which includes uh, variational autoencoder, adversarial networks, and flow-based models. Let's first look at the variational autoencoder and compare it with autoencoder. This graph illustrates the latent space on a 2D dimension of the 10, 10, uh, 10 handwritten digits from an autoencoder. We can see that the classes are well separated with each dot corresponding to a training data point. However, since the mapping between the latent space and the data space is deterministic, it is hard to answer the question, how does a random Z map to X? For example, if we randomly selected two data points on the latent space, say uh, let, uh, number one and number seven, we draw a line and pick this middle point and ask, um, which number would this point map to? We do not know. It's most likely uh, would map to something that, that is unlike to any number uh, of, of from zero to nine. And variation, variational autoencoder, on the other hand, allows us to have a better control on the mapping between the latent space and the data space. By modeling the latent space distribution directly, um, by design, the latent space will be continuous, which allows for easy random sampling, interpolation, and data simulation. Looking at this graph on the right, between the observed data point of one and two, if we randomly selected some point in between them, we would receive a reconstruction of a shape that is in between one and two. So how does VAE achieve this goal? First, let's review the objective function of autoencoder. It tries to minimize the reconstruction loss between the observed data X and the reconstructed point X prime. As illustrated before, we do not have any control over how Z maps to X. All we know is that it does a good job in reconstructing X. 
VA, on the other hand, explicitly aims to maximize the log likelihood of the observed data, log Px, by leveraging the theory of variational inference. In this in inequality, log Px would be always larger or equal to itself minus a positive or, or non-negative uh, term, which is the KL di divergence of two distributions. The first distribution is the estimated posterior probability of mapping the observed data X into the latent space C. And the second distribution is the real uh, conditional probability. This is called the variational lower bound of log likelihood of X. This lower bound can be manipulated into something we can estimate. Um, the first term would be an expectation of X's conditional distribution on Z. And the second term would be the negative of KL divergence between the estimated posterior distribution of Z, Q5, Zx, and the prior distribution of Z, Pz. Looking at the difference between the two lines, um, the log likelihood of X becomes an expected uh, log conditional probability of X and the conditional X disappears uh, from the first line's KL in, and the, uh, into the second line of KL. And the second line now can be parameterized. Taking a closer look at the elbow, we can see that the first term um, is actually has uh, encoder-decoder, um, which is autoencoder structure. It tries to maximize the likelihood of reconstructing X by first mapping it to the latent space Z. The expectation is taken with respect to Z's posterior distribution from the encoder, the green part in this graph. And the expectation is taking on the log likelihood of constructing X from Z, which is represented by the blue decoder network. The second term, the KL divergence, can be seen as a regularization term on the encoder. It requires that the posterior distribution of Z should be cl as close as possible to a prior distribution, PZ. For prior distributions, we usually choose simple distributions such as multivariate Gaussian or Bernoulli so that it is easy to sample uh, the latent vector Z from the estimated mean and standard deviation. Here is an example of MNIST handwritten numbers generated by VAE. An interesting observation is that we can visualize the similarity among different numbers from their spatial distance. So one is close to seven and then tr gradually transit to, to nine and then four and then zero. Now let's summarize how VAE fits into our three-step anomaly detection framework and compare it with AE. First, in terms of mapping function, autoencoder learns a fixed mapping from the data space to the latent space and then back to the data space. For variational autoencoder, both the, uh, both the encoder and decoder tries to learn distribution rather than a fixed mapping. When it comes to anomaly detection, this would enable selective sensitivity to reconstruction, meaning that when there is high variance among normal data, we would tolerate a larger deviation from the average behavior. When calculating anomaly scores, autoencoder uses reconstruction errors, which are L1 or L2 distance of the observed data to the reconstructed data. For VAE, its reconstruction probability already measures the likelihood that the data belongs to normal data, data space. So for VAE, we could use p-value as in statistical models to form the decision threshold, and the score has statistical meanings. Using the VAE reconstruction probability as an anomaly score, Anne and Cho 2015 compared the performance of using VAE for anomaly detection on the common data sets. Um, the first one is the MNIST handwritten data when detecting anomaly viewing each digit as the anomaly class, VAE outperforms AE linear PCA and kernel PCA in eight out of the 10 cases in terms of AUC score. The second example is anomaly detection on KDD network intrusion data. 
there is one normal, normal class and four abnormal classes. Table four shows the AUC when viewing all the anomaly classes as anomalous. Um, VAE has higher AUC score in three out of the four cases. And in table five, only the class on each row are labeled as anomaly. And VAE has higher AUC for all four cases. Now let's take, uh, let's look at some VAE based anomaly detection applications. The first application is Donut, which adapts a VAE structure to detecting anomalies in seasonal business time series data. It especially paid attention to dealing with historical anomalies and missing data points, which are uh, the two main pain points in anomaly detection scenarios. The input data are sliding windows of X with W dimensions. Then they are fed into a MLP network, our simplest building block, and then mapped into the K-dimensional mean and variance in the latent space. There are three key innovations of Donut comparing to basic BAE. The first one is this modified objective function that deals with anomaly and missing data. We know that the, the missing points or anomalous points inside the training data could contaminate and weaken the power of the network to learn normal behavior. The solution proposed here is to downweight the abnormal behavior without discarding these contaminated training data set altogether. So recall the VAE objective. The first part is the reconstruction probability. Donut puts a parameter F uh, w uh, in front of this probability, which would become zero when x w in the input window uh, is an anomaly or missing. This allows us to only optimize for the non-missing and non-anomaly data points when training the network. Um, the objective function also applies a weighting beta in front of the prior probability of z. This would help forcing anomalous data points to have a lower posterior probabilities. Thus, in scoring, they would more likely to get lower anomaly scores. To calculate anomaly score, this paper follows the previous one in using the reconstruction probability. So in addition to the uh, modified elbow objective function, Donut also tried two other ways to reduce the adverse effect of the known anomalies and missing data. First, in training, it randomly selected a lambda proportion of normal points and then set them to zero. This would help amplify the effect of the modified elbow objective function. And second, in detection, when there are missing points, um, they would first use an MCMC method to fill in the holes before doing detection. More specifically, it decomposes the sliding window into uh, the observed data XO, these black lines, and the missing data XM. Uh, it then puts this sliding window into an autoencoder framework and generates a new reconstructed time series until this XM converges. Uh, you can see from the graph in the first iteration, the reconstruction of XM is really bad. But as we take more iterations, we will come to a very smooth imputation of the missing values and the sliding window would become with no holes. Donut is tested on 18 business metrics. On average, 0.3% of data are missing and 6% um, are anomaly windows. So looking at this graph, uh, the blue column represents the VAE baseline. The green adds the modified elbow onto, uh, onto VAE and we see a huge uh, increase in the F1 score. Um, the purple column, in addition, add the MCMC missing data imputation to it. And again, we see a little bit of uh, performance increase. So the conclusion for Donut is that the modified elbow contributes most improvement um, to the VAE in this scenario. And it is recommended to always adopt um, the MCMC-based missing data imputation in detection. 
In a follow-up study, the authors also applied an extended version of Donut to the task of multi-time series uh, detection. Now let's look at another very interesting application, fake news detection. This paper tries to learn shared representations from different sources to make detection. From the architecture on the left-hand side, there is a textual decoder, a visual decoder, uh, and their last layers are concatenated to generate the mu and sigma of the latent space. Then uh, the latent vectors are sampled from this mu and sigma. And in the, uh, in the decoder network, the common latent space would then be decoded to textual and visual representations. The VAE structure allows us to learn a latent representation that combines the textual and virtual information so that they can then feed the latent vector into a binary classifier, the fake news detector, to obtain the anomaly score. This deci uh, the decision threshold is, is learned from labels according to precision recall. And this model architecture fall into the semi-supervised integrated category. The VAE part is unsupervised learning of data representation. The fake news detector is the supervised part. That's why we call it semi-supervised. And the model has an integrated loss that combines the VAE loss and the detector loss. The authors compared their methods on two data sets, Twitter and Weibo, with two groups of baseline models. The first group are single mode models where only the textual or visual information is used. The second group are multi-mode models in which all the baselines um, also combine both textual and visual information. They evaluated the lift of the proposed VAE structure by comparing with the best performer among the baseline. Um, so for Twitter, the best best baseline is attention RN model, and uh, they increased accurate accuracy from 0.66 to 0.74, and F1 score from 0.67 to 0.75. Uh, and for Weibo, the best baseline is the events adversarial network, and they lifted the accuracy from 0.78 to 0.82. Now let's turn to another popular strand of generative models, the ones with adversarial learning. There are two components in the GAN framework. The generator learns input data representation, and the discriminator tries to distinguish input and fake data samples from the generator. The objective function of GAN is a min-max game played between the discriminator and the generator. More specifically, the value function on the right-hand side is the expected log likelihood that the data could be correctly classed into fake and real. The discriminator tries to maximize this value function, while the generator tries to minimize it. Here is an example of how a generator generates realistic data after model training. We start from the latent space, which is consisted of white noise. After a few iterations, we could already see the shape of numbers. And after many iterations, the generator could completely generate realistic handwritten numbers. Here is another example of using GAN to generate time series data. On the left-hand side, we see the real data. In the middle is the generator output after 10 iterations. It is still quite noisy. And on the right-hand side, we see the generator output after 60 iterations. The generated data already starts to mimic the up and downs in the true time series. So how does GAN differ from VAE? VAE tries to learn the conditional data distribution, conditioning on the latent space being normal. The generated data from VAE could be would be continuous and smooth in nature. GAN, on the other hand, doesn't have distribution assumptions, but tr just try to mimic real data through the competition between the generator and the discriminator. It has been shown that GAN is better at capturing discontinuity in images. 
from the example picture here, we can see that GAN on the second row is better at learning the boundaries. Now let's walk through the variants of GAN applied to anomaly detection use cases. So first, a natural way of using GAN for anomaly detection is to directly use the discriminator. In this case, the discriminator would be the mapping function that maps input data into the anomaly space. Anomaly score would then just be the discriminator loss. The larger the loss, the more likely data X is anomalous. The detection threshold could again be fine-tuned by precision and recall on a training data set. This is a semi-supervised model in the sense that when training GAN, we usually only use normal data. Um, however, a major drawback for this method is that it heavily relies on the discriminator, which is just an auxiliary structure that aims to help the generator to learn. So next, we study how we can incorporate the generator part and help in the anomaly detection task. This method is usually called ANOGAN, named after the paper that proposed this method. The main idea is that when a data point is anomalous, in addition to having high discriminator loss, it also means that the generator would never have generated such data from any point in the latent space. So it would have a high reconstruction loss. However, uh, in the GAN structure, which differs from AE or VAE, we, ha we have been directly generating data from a random latent space. Uh, and to calculate this reconstruction loss, we would need an encoder that encodes X to the latent space. Here is the loss function for the encoder. The first part is to minimize the distance between the real data and the generated data from the encoded X. And the second part is to maximize the likelihood that the discriminator would view the generated data as true data. The mapping function now includes discriminator, generator, and decoder, and encoder. The encoder network E, or theta, can be learned after the generator and discriminator are learned, as we show in this uh, loss function, or the three of them could be learned altogether. The anomaly score is a combination of discriminator loss and reconstruction loss. And the decision threshold is, again, uh, could be fine-tuned by precision and recall. This is, again, a semi-supervised model uh, where we would only use normal data to train, uh, and it is a one-phase model. Here is an example that applies ANOGAN on eye disease detection. As with most scans on image data, both the discriminator and the generator will be using the basic, the CNN basic building block. This graph illustrates the effectiveness of the detection. The left block are normal images, and the right, right block are diseased abnormal images. The first row shows the original image. The second row um, is the reconstructed image from the generator. And the third row is the difference between the two, the residue and the uh, red part highlights the uh, larger residue. And thus that those are the anomalous points. And again, uh, anomalous score is determined by this reconstruction loss plus a discriminator loss. The paper compares ANOGAN with autoencoder and naive GAN. We can see that autoencoder reaches AUC score of 0.73. Naive GAN is better at precision, but worse at recall compared to autoencoder. And after adding the reconstruction loss, ANOGAN outperforms both methods. Another variant of GAN for anomaly detection is combining autoencoder or variational autoencoder into the adversarial architecture. In the K and others 2018, they used an autoencoder structure for the generator. So in addition to the adversarial loss, they also get the contextual loss 
which is essentially the reconstruction loss from the autoencoder. The benefit of having this autoencoder structure is to better learn the mapping from data space to the latent space. And in addition to the encoder already existed in the generator, the GE, the model structure also has a separate encoder E, which shares the same structure as GE, but with different parameters. The encoder loss measures the distance between Z and E um, and EX. By comparing this encoder loss with the contextual loss, we can see that the encoder loss is exactly the contextual loss mapped to the latent space. So GE of X is the original data mapping to the latent space through the generator, and E of GX is the reconstructed X mapping to the latent space through the encoder. And the existence of the additional encoder enables us to view anomaly from the perspective of the latent space, which in many cases are of a lower dimension. The anomaly score in this model is then the encoder loss. The intuition is that if the data is anomalous, we would expect e, EX and Z to be very different. In the use case of AK and others 2018 paper, they find that using the lower dimensional latent space could do a better job for summarizing anomaly information from high dimensional data. The decision threshold, again, can be fine-tuned by precision and recall. And this model is a semi-supervised one-phase model. Here is a comparison of the models we mentioned so far on anomaly detection on image data set. Akay and others 2018 has found that autoencoder-based GAN, the blue and yellow lines, outperforms BAE and NOGAN on the MNIST and CIFAR image data. They also show that the AE GAN structure could significantly reduce runtime for image anomaly detection tested on four image data sets. Now let's look at another example that applies GAN on anomaly detection. The goal for this paper is to segment out the brain lesion area. The generator is modeled as a variational autoencoder network, and there is no additional encoder to look at encoding loss. The rationale is uh, the VAE structure could make the generator more stable by putting constraints on the latent space, and VAE could also help with catching the global character characteristics of the images. The algorithm alternates in minimizing the, uh, the VAE loss and the discriminator loss. The VAE loss is composed of three parts. The first part is the reconstruction loss from the VAE network. This loss is uh, this application specific in that each X uh, is a vector of all the image pixels and the loss is defined on the pixel wise L1 decision. Uh, L1 distance between the input image and the reconstruction. It is a little bit different from the var uh, variational autoencoder we, we saw before. The second term is the KL divergence with a prior latent distribution. This is just a, a normal uh, KL divergence. And the third term is the adversarial loss where the generator tries to increase the log likelihood of being identified as normal data. And the anomaly score um, is, is using this first part of the VAE loss, which is the reconstruction loss. The threshold is taken at the 98th percentile of training data after filtering out uh, so, some of the rule-based uh, anomaly scores that are very unlikely to be uh, a true anomaly. The model is evaluated using the DICE score, which measures how much the detected lesion segmentation overlaps with true segments. Among the various baselines, the VAE baseline already reaches an average DICE score of 0.59, and the 
VAE GAN proposed in this paper lifted it a little bit to 0.6. With this, let me hand over to Yang to introduce the second strand of generative, uh, to the next strand of generative models. Thank you. Okay, uh, so, so now is the Q&A section for, uh, for the GAN and VAE related questions. If you have any questions, again, you can post on chat or unmute yourself and ask the question. And after this section, we have a 15 minutes break. So you can, if you don't have any questions, you can take a break and come back uh, at three. Okay, uh, I see uh, uh, one question says, have you applied VAE to applications like system performance, CPU, memory, network anomaly detection? Um, so part of our, uh, our monitored metrics are like CPU site speed um, and latency and QPS metrics. Uh, we have applied AE on them and our VAE is in offline experiments. Uh, so in terms of offline experiments, yes, we do have VAE tested on those metrics. Uh, and it is perform performing well. We tried uh, VAE and CNN uh, and they, their performance are very similar to each other. Thanks. And another question, in real application, when you are tuning threshold and other parameters to adapt your solution to customer's need between recall and precision, do you prefer one over the other? Uh, yes, we do. Usually we, we would uh, guarantee recall over pre precision because uh, we don't wanna miss any important anomalies. Um, so, uh, so our goal is actually by maintaining recall at a high level, say 90%, we wanna reduce the false alert by increasing the precision. Yeah, and the next, uh, or one gets higher priority than the other, uh, or, or you simply just focus on that one. Yeah, okay, I think we answered that question. So we do separately look at them instead of combining them into F1 score. Have you applied any of the deep model methods to streaming data? Um, I think it depends on how you, how you define streaming. So in production, all the data are streaming. Um, so what we do is we would train a model or several models on historical data which are not streaming and totally offline but and then we post the models we, we serve the model in our application so in real time when the data comes in uh, we would fetch its current data and its historical data and then feed into our model to do the detection and next, do we train GAN-based models on just the normal inputs or a mix of normal and anomalous inputs as we did in robust deep AE? So for GAN, uh, right now what we have tried is only using the normal inputs. Uh, so basically to have it learn uh, the normal behavior and generate the normal data. Yeah, we haven't tried mixing it, the normal and abnormal. And the next question, um, has there been any research in combining self-supervised learning techniques for images um, in the context of anomaly detection using supervised, semi-supervised methods instead of AE and GAN? Um, I'm not sure if I understand this question uh, 
can you clarify yourself a little bit? If, if you're online, maybe you can unmute yourself and just communicate. Hey, hi, this is Garrett. So that was my hi. question. Um, yeah. So there's this bunch of new self-supervised techniques that project out some kind of representation. And I'm wondering if anyone has used that, like the, like the embedding layer in the autoencoder to do anomaly detection. Uh, you mean using uh, using the embedding layer, the hidden layer in the uh, in the autoencoder to no, extract no, no. that? No, no, no. Like right now, using uh, autoencoders, you guys use like the middle layer to do the anomaly detection. Um, has anyone looked at using self supervised techniques, which usually has an embedding layer somewhere in the model as well, and pull that out to do like anomaly detection and compare it to other? To like the other methods that you're using. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, in one example, I showed the fake news detection. Actually, it is doing this. It is training a VAE model uh, by combining the textual and image data, um, and uh, and it is extracting the uh, the latent vector, the Z vector, out and to put it in a fake news detector. So I hope this answers the question. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the next one is on the donut model. If you train it on one time series, do you think you can use it to reconstruct the different time series correlated to the one the model was trained with for scalability reason? Yeah, I think this is a very good question. I think for that paper per se, uh, they are training their model on uh, a bunch of time series. So they, they feed in all their time series uh, into the model. So basically the model have seen all different kinds of um, of time series and uh, they do not train it one by one. So they, they do not train one model for one time series. And this is actually also our goal in production. Uh, we want to train one big model and put it online to serve all kinds of uh, data. And we are wo uh, working towards that, that goal. Uh, and you can basically improve this model by using transfer learning on it to, to fine tune some unseen data in the, uh, that, that you haven't seen in the training data set. And we have also uh, tried to put in embedding layers, basically some, uh, some information about the ID or the shape of the, of the time series uh, embedded into an uh, embedding vector and also put that in the embedding vector into, the, into our model. And we also see uh, good performance using that model. Um, and then the next question, follow on to AE for system performance. Have you used AE to detect feature anomalies and drift detection used for other models? Uh, so for feature anomalies, we haven't used anomaly detection yet in production, but we do have uh, productionized models that does feature anomaly detection, but uh, that is still mostly based on statistical models. Um, yeah, I, I think we are almost uh, at time for the QA, uh, but you can take a rest and I can um, keep answer maybe just one last question and then we can take a break. Um, so do those streaming data models take concept drift into consideration? Uh, you mean, when you say drift, I, I suppose is if our training data uh, has an average of say 10 and then it drifted to 12, how do, we, uh, how do we deal with that situation? So currently we will retrain our model, uh, but in the future, I think we can fine tune our existing model. So, uh, so let's take 10 minutes break. Thank you all for your great questions. And we will continue at three uh, to have the second uh, have our present of our presentation. Thanks.
Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a good short break. Uh, so let's start with our second half of the presentation. Thanks, Wayne. This is Yang. Now I will talk briefly about the third type of generative models, flow-based models. Uh, they're not as popular as the AE or GAIN for anomaly detection applications right now, as they are uh, pretty new research areas. A quick call back to the variational autoencoder formulation for comparison here. VAE approximately uh, maximizes the data distribution Px um, through maximizing its lower bound elbow. Um, as shown in the equation here, the frame part is elbow, which equals the log likelihood of the data um, minus the KL distance between Q5, the encoder in the AE, versus the conditional latent distribution uh, Z given X. As KO distance is always positive, uh, VAE optimized over the lower bound of uh, log Px. To formulate VAE for anomaly detection tasks, uh, the encoder Q P, uh, Q5 Q is parameterized by some simple distributions such as Gaussian. Um, the normal the normal score is the mean reconstructed probability. Uh, which is defined based on Q5, uh, the encoder, and P theta, the decoder, together. One caveat of uh, VAE is that there is no guarantee that uh, Q5 is close to the real posterior of PZ given X. Um, when they are not similar, uh, this there may be a big gap between the lower bound and the Px. Unlike VAE, flow-based model optimize uh, the data distribution Px directly using normalizing flows. As shown here, um, the encoder in the flow-based model is a sequence of invertible transformation, um, which uh, can be notified, can be uh, denoted as F. And since F are invertible, so its inverse uh, is used in decoder. For anomalization tasks, flow-based models can be formulated as follow. Uh, the mapping function still uh, uses an encoder and decoder structure to uh, try to reconstruct data with now uh, the encoder function f invertible and f inverse used in the encoder, a uh, decoder. Um, the, anom the anomaly score is not uh, the reconstruction uh, probabilities anymore. Uh, we can use log likelihood value of the sample directly. Uh, the lower the log likelihood value is, uh, more likely uh, the data sample is an anomaly. Schmidt 2019 paper uh, actually uses uh, this setup to de detect uh, abnormal time series uh, data. But know that uh, this formulation is just one of the formulations uh, for uh, anomaly detection as flow-based model is still a pretty new area. And uh, Besides, knowing the data distribution can actually offer different ways uh, to detect anomalies. In Diaz's uh, 2020 paper, they use an aggregation function to, on top of the log likelihood value to detect abnormal trajectory data. A Rezivok, a Rezivkov uh, 2020 uh, paper uh, uses another way uh, they use a supervised anomaly action setup um, by actually adding a lot more etched uh, normal data, which are sampled from the estimated data distribution Px uh, from the normalizing flow. 
Now, let me briefly explain why flow-based model can estimate the data distribution directly. Normalizing flow first introduced in Resendi's 2016 paper transforms a simple distribution into a complex one by applying a sequence of invertible transformation. As shown in the graph uh, below, zi equals to fi on zi minus one. Um, Z all, here, all the zi's are the latent space in between um, the initial uh, prior p0 um, to the final input space zk. As we can see, with uh, a lot of transformation, a simple Z0 uh, distribution such as Gaussian can be transformed to follow a much uh, complex distribution as ZK. Using this uh, change of variable trick, then we can rewrite the log likelihoods of the data samples as the log of uh, log of P0 minus the sum of uh, log Jacobian determinants of fi's. To make the estimation trackable and uh, to make the backward propagation work in deep model, fi need to satisfy first um, its Jacobian determ determinant uh, need to be easy to compute. Second, uh, they need to be invertible. Here are some examples uh, of simple uh, normalizing flows which satisfy the previous two constraints. Planar flow, the scale and the sh uh, shift in each transformation, which slides the z-space with hyperplans uh, where each hyperplan contracts or expands the space around it. The radial flow introduces spheres in the latent space, which either contract or expand the space inside the sphere. Resendi's 2016 paper shows how planar and their radial flows can transfer Gaussian and the uniform distribution to much more complex uh, distribution family. And you can see here, uh, more transformation uh, chain uh, can actually provide a much richer family of distribution. Another way to use normalizing flow for non-detection is to couple it with VAE to improve its detection performance. Recall that the encoder uh, Q5 in VAE is usually parameterized by some simple distribution such as Gaussian or uniform. A uh, flow-based model can be then used um, in VAE's encoder to capture more complexity. As shown here uh, is the encoder structure in SUS 2019 paper. They propose our GRU VAE model, which is called OMI anomaly. In between the encoder and decoder, they added a planar normalizing flow layer uh, with a component with a K uh, layers in between encoder and decoder. Um, in their paper, uh, compared to regular VAE, um, OMI anomaly um, OMI anomaly model does improve the anomaly detection performance. As seen here, the yellow ones are the OMI anomaly model they proposed, and the green one are the model uh, without the planar uh, flow. And you can see a yellow one does show better performance across uh, three different data sets uh, tested in the paper. There are a lot more complex normalizing flows than planar and the radial flows. Autoregressive flows are one of them, uh, which introduce dependencies between uh, different dimensions of the latent variable. Uh, so suitable, especially for sequential data. Uh, here I will not go into a lot of detail, but it just gives you some context uh, for 
the two popular uh, autoregressive flows, MAST autoregressive flow, MAF, and the inverse autoregressive flow, IAF. Um, as shown on the left figure, MAF has um, input Xi not only depend on Zi, but also depend on X1 to X minus um, one. So um, the model is efficient on likelihood estimation, but uh, slow on sampling new, set, uh, new data on the distribution on the, from the distribution because they need to uh, sample in sequence. On the contrary, IAF on the right uh, has Xi depend on Z1 to Zi minus one in addition to Zi. Um, so they are slow on estimation, uh, but very fast on sampling. Uh, comparatively, MAF are more, uh, more often used in anomaly detection tasks, and they're used uh, to model time series data directly in Schmidt's uh, 2019 paper. As shown in Papa Macorio's 2018 paper, uh, compared with uh, MADE, an autoregressive uh, autoencoder structure with Gaussian conditionals, uh, MAF can better fit the target distribution with X2 depend on X1. Um, the black scatter plots are the transformed data points, uh, data samples in Z0 latent space. Uh, the ones from MAF shows a very good Gaussian pattern, while the ones from MADE uh, shows a um, uh, bad fit of the model. In summary, flow-based model can capture uh, more complex data patterns than variational autoencoder, so they can be uh, used directly to estimate the distribution than the taxonomy, or they can be coupled with uh, variational autoencoder uh, and use it to estimate its encoder um, structure. However, uh, since Fi are invertible, Zi's are of the same dimension as X. So they may cause some problem when the input data space uh, is very high. The data dimension is very high. So you will have a lot of uh, parameter to estimate. Um, besides, uh, right now, only a few anomaly detection applications use flow-based model um, so it still requires more research and study uh, to um, quantify the pros and cons of the approach. Okay, uh, now let's conclude this uh, popular deep structure for a non-detection subsection. Uh, it is quite a long session uh, as there are a lot of research and application in this area. Um, I wonder if you still remember what are the popular deep models used for non detection right now. Uh, if you don't remember all of them, don't worry. Let me give you some key takeaways to remind you. Uh, so deep one class, uh, autoencoder, and the generative models such as VAE, GAIN, flow-based models have very powerful mapping functions uh, to map uh, different data, different types of input data and are popularly used uh, for non applications. Autoencoder is very uh, popular um, because of its simplicity. Um, however, in practice, uh, remember to use regular, regularized autoencoders to avoid overfitting. Generative models uh, learns normal data distribution in the latent space, so they're easy uh, for in interpolation than um, autoencoder model. In this last subsection of deep learning for anomaly detection, I will talk about anomaly detection with sparse labels. There are two aspects, semi-supervised learning and transfer learning. Let's start with semi-supervised learning. So far, uh, you've seen a lot of unsupervised deep anomaly detection methods, such as autoencoder and uh, generative models. Even with some labels provided, 
they are mostly used to fine tune the decision boundary. In real applications, sparse labels are usually available through human labeling efforts. Not a lot, but they do exist. Then the question comes, can we uh, better leverage them for detection? Before we dive into the details, let's see how different type of learning method uh, use labels for anomaly detection tasks. This example comes from Ralph's 2019 paper. We have a training set with a small number of anomaly labeled. Besides, there are two other groups of anomaly in the test sets. Supervised methods uh, take all the labels in the training set and learn the discriminative boundary to separate the seen anomalies in the training from the normal data. You can see the anomaly score contour on the right. Uh, the lighter color indicates high, higher anomaly scores, so more likely being an anomaly. Um, we can see that a supervised method failed to detect anomaly in the test set as um, they never learns uh, data distribution, the, uh, never learns the normal data distribution. Now let's look at unsupervised method. They remove the labeled anomalies in training, then learn the normal data distribution. As a result, um, they can detect anomalies in the test set, but they fail to detect anomaly in the training data set. What about uh, two-phase semi-supervised methods? Um, same as unsupervised, they remove the labeled anomalies in training, then learn the normal dis data distribution. In addition, uh, they tune the decision threshold using the anomaly labeled in the training set. The model can be tuned to correctly identify all anomalies, but uh, they were also uh, include many normal data as anomalies. Do you think we can do better? Yeah, the answer is yes. We can uh, through integrate the semi-supervised method. Um, they learn both the normal data distribution and the anomaly scores for the labels. You can see the anomaly scores uh, are now banded uh, around the training anomalies area to make it more accurate. And now it can identify uh, both train and test anomalies without uh, uh, misidentifying the normal data. Now let's summarize the mentioned uh, four type of anomaly de detection methods. Supervised methods are not commonly used in anomaly detection applications, even though they use labels. Um, They only optimize for the seen anomaly scores, uh, which can cause overfit. The supervised methods are very popular, such as SVDD. Uh, they don't use label for training. Uh, they may remove anomaly labels to clean up the training data and optimize for data representation. Sometimes the learned um, model is not optimal. Two-phase uh, semi-supervised methods are quite similar to unsupervised um, during data representation learning phase. In addition, they use labels to fine-tune the decision threshold. Um, the decision boundary can be more fine-tuned than unsupervised method, but can still be suboptimal. Integrated semi-supervised methods, uh, which gained more attention recently, 
optimize data representation and anomaly scores from uh, the labels. They can find a compact decision, a description of data based on the label information. Um, as, super, as sparse labels are usually available in real applications, uh, incorporating labels into the model optimization objective can improve model performance compared to two-phase or unsupervised method. Now let's see two examples how to learn compact data representation leveraging label information. The first example is a deep one class model. A record a formulation of deep SVDD, uh, which is an unsupervised method uh, without using uh, labels for training. It is uh, an extension of um, uh, SVDD uh, with uh, encoder structure, encoder and decoder structure. Um, consider the reality that in addition to the N and labeled as example, uh, and labeled samples X1 to Xn, we also have M labeled samples um, with uh, Yi equals to negative one means anomaly and positive one means normal. Uh, deep set proposed in Roth's 2019 paper introduce a new turn in the learning objective compared to deep SVDD. Um, when yi equals to one indicates normal data, these turns will add back to the uh, normal data distance to the center. So the smaller the better. Um, when yi equals to negative one. Uh, which indicates anomaly. Then it penalizes the inverse of the anomaly distance. Intuitively, it pushes the anomaly further away from the center. And then the parameter eta balance the two objectives. The paper also quantifies uh, SVD, a deep, S, a deep set performance on three public image data set um, against uh, a strong baseline SSAD, which is a state-of-art semi-supervised method with a fair advantage by tuning its hyperparameters. Hybrid uh, versus raw means uh, whether the latent vectors from autoencoder are used as input or just the raw inputs. We can see uh, from the um, AUC uh, plot here, uh, deep, SDB, S, uh, deep set shows comparable performance as uh, SSAD on easy task, tasks, things such as uh, minced and uh, fashion minced, uh, but outperform on harder tasks like uh, uh, CIFAR 10. Compared to its unsupervised version as a deep SVDD uh, with only 1% labels, uh, it can improve across all three data sets. 4% on minced, 1% on fashion minced, since it's already very performant, and 13% on uh, the hardest one, CIFAR 10. Which is, uh, so the result tell us that uh, incorporating labels can really improve the anomaly section performance. Another example used, uh, um, another semi-supervised example used the MLP structure. Uh, Guan Song, a 2019 paper proposed uh, deviation networks. Uh, in their uh, setups, it assumes a small set of labeled anomalies are available in addition to the unlabeled set. Uh, it uses an MLP as uh, the mapping function then a linear mapping upon an MLP output uh, as the normally score. Then the normally score is normalized by a reference mean and variance uh, value to determine whether the sample is a normally or not. Let's look at the loss function uh, here. 
uh, dev x is the normalized uh, uh, anomaly score of sample x. There are two components uh, for one sample in the loss, func loss function. When uh, x is normal, uh, when, we maxim when we try to minimize loss, then it will push def normal to zero. Um, when x is anomaly, uh, actually uh, the optimization will push def anomaly larger than a, uh, which enforce a deviation of at least uh, a from uh, the normal scores. The paper quantifies the model performance over nine multi-dimensional data sets. Here, F1 and F2 denotes the percentage of labeled anomalies in training and in total. Um, here, the SVDD is actually not the unsupervised version, but um, with label incorporated similarly as DevNet. So, use a slightly different loss function setup as a deep set. iForest is a supervised random for, uh, isolation forest. And uh, there are also two other uh, deep structure for detection. Um, we can see with less than 0.6% uh, of labels in training, DevNet uh, obtains better performance than all the baselines. The previous section talks about how to leverage existing labels in the data set. Now let's see what to do when data and labels are not enough. Deep models need data to be performant. Uh, the more data they have, the more they can outperform traditional methods in terms of capturing nonlinear and a complex data pattern. When the training data are not enough, we can use uh, transfer learning um, to transfer knowledge from the relevant problems to our problem of interest. For deep anomaly detection, the following two uh, transfer learning techniques are useful. Data transfer through data augmentation techniques and the feature transfer through representation transfer. Data augmentation techniques can be used to generate synthetic data samples and enlarge training set for better normal representation learning. As shown here, um, there are two big categories of uh, data augmentation techniques, domain specific and uh, generative models. Here, we will not talk about generative model anymore for anomaly detections. If we can estimate um, the generative model, uh, there is no need to generate any synthetic uh, data anymore since the data, the model can be directly used for detection. Uh, the domain specific um, categories assume certain prior knowledge uh, to help enlarge the training set. For image data, kernel filter, uh, geometric or color transformations are popular ones. Um, for image, uh, for time series, uh, time domain and frequency domain transformation are most popular. As image uh, data augmentation is already widely studied, here I just give you uh, some context on time series data augmentations. First, we can use frequency domain transformations who uh, Fulia transformation, as proposed in one's 2020 paper. Um, use um, frequency domain transfer. Uh, we can rewrite uh, the time series in amplitude and uh, phase uh, component. Uh, for augmentation, then we can add a noise to perturbate the transform the uh, series um, 
and the uh, mimic the original time series, which still capture the time dependency in the data, but but with slight modification uh, to make model training more robust. Another type of um, augmentation is on the time domain directly through jettering, uh, scaling, rotation, um, and etc. With augmented normal data, we can see uh, deep model performance improving. In Ernst's 2017 paper, they used the CNN model uh, plus multiple augmentation transformations. However, uh, not all of them work. Um, for example, jitter and a scale, they don't work well here. Um, while rotation is the best performance. So this is, um, this tells us that uh, uh, you, you need to first uh, uh, think about whether the prior knowledge uh, suit your uh, data of interest. Gauss uh, 2020 paper used UNET, which is a more complex uh, model structure to detect uh, time series anomalies. Um, they use uh, data augmentation uh, on both frequency and a time domain to add more uh, time series. And um, the proposed method with augmentation shows much better performance comparing to without. In addition to directly augmenting training data similar to the task, we can use representation transfer techniques to borrow transfer uh, our representation learned from relevant tasks. In deep models, upper layers usually learn task specific uh, representations such as a uh, man or woman's face, um, while the lower layer learns more general um, uh, representation features, such as lines and dots. Um, therefore, the lower layers uh, can be shared with, uh, can be shared for um, other tasks easily. For example, if I'm not detecting a woman or man uh, face, instead I'm detecting um, plants and animals, we can also use the uh, lower layer learned um, to improve the performance. For anomaly detection, the data representation layer uh, can be um, extracted uh, from relevant problems to enhance performance. One way is to extract or fine tune from a large per train model, such as AlexNet's uh, for image data. So even if your um, training data set is very small, but by uh, using uh, the lower layer uh, learned from AlexNet, um, it can uh, easily um, boost your detection model because now you have a better representation to represent your data. Uh, another way to um, extract representation is to uh, join train with some accelerated accelerate accelerate test. Uh, Musa uh, proposed such a structure uh, by adding a, a auxiliary, auxiliary task, task uh, to predict weekday and weekday um, in addition to anomaly detection problems. Okay, now let's conclude the session with some key takeaways. 
Um, incorporating sparse labels into data representation can improve anomaly detection performance. Transfer learning techniques such as data augmentation or representation transfer can help with data sparsity issues. Semi-supervised methods um, and the transfer learning techniques are still merging approaches in applications compared to research. Thanks, Yang. Um, so the floor is open for Q&A. If you have questions, you can uh, either type or uh, type in the chat box, or you can unmute yourself and ask directly. And Yang is online to answer the question. So the first question is, has there been any research about using active learning to acquire more labels? Um, I think uh, this is an area we're trying to look for uh, some literatures about this, but we haven't uh, uh, find uh, many recent uh, papers about this. So I can't give you a very detailed uh, answers for that, but I think uh, for active learning, right? Um, it's usually to uh, kind of get labels to uh, <clears throat> for supervised methods, right? Try to find uh, labels you um, predict wrongly to uh, uh, fine tune your uh, boundaries. But for anomaly detection, usually we want to um, probably just get more labels among anomalies. Um, and this is more supervised, uh, unsupervised method. Uh, so, so far we haven't seen a lot of literature about that right now. Uh, do you want me to read that question? Uh oh, yeah, I can read it. So the question is from uh, the question is, uh, when uh, you say the anomaly labels are sparse. How sparse are we talking about? Um, so is it like one in 100 or one in one, uh, 10,000, right? Um, and would that affect the category of anomaly detection we apply, uh, assuming our labels are av available? So here um, in the paper I just listed out there, uh, they were showing some of the anomaly percentage uh, you're seeing there, right? So uh, they range from uh, maybe uh, less than 5% to even 0.1%. Uh, so comparing to the supervised method, it is definitely uh, much more uh, sparse and unbalanced. Um, I should say it's probably uh, more like uh, if you want to make your label more performant and help your model to uh, improve performance, I think it will probably be something closer to maybe one in 100 or one in 1,000. Because um, uh, those are, uh, at least from the, uh, from the papers, they were using percentage of uh, uh, labels there. Um, Uh, and uh, you can also see like when you have more label, definitely they can help you to improve the uh, performance. If the label kind of um, the number of labels decrease, then of course uh, you will probably see pretty similar performance as a supervised method. Um, the other question is, um, is it possible to get real time anomaly labels or are they usually delayed by investigation? Um, I think uh, this, 
both are yes, because uh, for detection, we do have, uh, uh, say, uh, in production, right, we need to do minute level detections or hourly level detections. Um, then uh, when the anomaly occurred, uh, the devs and the engineer uh, were looking into it. So they received an alert about it in real time. Uh, but in terms of uh, uh, how they label it, we were encouraged them to label in real time. Uh, but there can also be delayed by investigation because sometimes you don't know what's the root cause. Um, in the LinkedIn use cases, we do allow user to give us real-time labels. Um, and once that label is given, then uh, um, the future detection will take that into consideration. Um, the next question is, I'm curious about how training evolves as label accumulated as you start to accumulate a much larger set of labels, uh, do the network uh, structure need to change or perhaps the weight in the loss functions? Um, so I think it depends, right? So um, just as to interrupt, in remind of time, this, this will be the last question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So, um, this is uh, pretty similar to other uh, machine learning methods, right? Because as you get more labels, uh, the older labels are also probably collected in a uh, more uh, kind of a longer time period. So you want to use recent data, right? Uh, for time series data, you also want to use more recent uh, time series data and labels to indicate the uh, recent dynamics. So it's more like a rolling window for training data. Um, and as you uh, accumulate more data, of course, it's more normal data and also um, uh, anomalies. So once you have more, of course, we should retrain it. And uh, um, we're also doing that uh, to try to improve performance. Uh, the network structure need to change. Um, I think it depends on whether your uh, for time series, right? we see whether the metric uh, dynamic has changed or it's uh, pattern has changed dramatically, right? If it hasn't changed much, uh, then we can just retrain the model use the similar network structure. Mm -hmm. uh, so due to sorry. the time limit, uh, we will stop here, but we can answer the rest of the question uh, in the chat. So yeah. let's go to the next section. Thanks, Yang. Hello, my name is Xin Wei Gong. I will talk about deep anomaly detection in action namely how industries are leveraging deep learning for their anomaly detection needs. I will focus on two case studies. First one is anomaly detection used in autonomous vehicle development. And the second case study is about the anomaly detection workflow we have developed here at LinkedIn. So first, Autonomous vehicle development. Why is anomaly detection important in developing self-driving cars? As you probably have heard in the media in recent years, self-driving systems are graded into six levels of automation. Level zero being no automation at all, and level five being full automation where they may not be even a steering wheel in the car. If you read the description of these automation levels, you will realize that higher automation levels essentially correspond to the car's ability of handling more and more anomalous cases. Let me make this point more concrete. Driving scenarios obey a long tail distribution, such that the common safe driving scenarios, such as lane keeping on highways, make up the vast majority of collected data. And an enormous number of rare scenarios make up the rest. Um, this could include adverse weather conditions, such as heavy fog, animals crossing onto the road, trash and debris on the road. Uh, it could also be cars driving on the wrong side of the street, some weird geometry of the road that the car has never seen before or very unusual behavior of other cars on the road. While each one of these cases is rare, they do happen. In fact, the chances that one of them will occur on any given day are actually quite high. With that said, it is definitely essential for autonomous vehicle developers 
to collect more of these rare data points in the long tail so that they can train robust models that can handle more and more of these anonymous scenarios. Now, let's see how anomaly detection fits into the autonomous vehicle development loop. A typical autonomous vehicle development loop look like this. Uh, let's say you start out with a set of models that would drive the car. This set of models could be a stack of models shown here on the right. The models that could include some perception models whose purpose is to understand the scenery, such as which image pixels belong to a tree, which pixels belong to a pedestrian, pavement, traffic lights, or which LiDAR rays come from another car or pedestrian. Um, next, the localization models reconstruct a local 3D scenery with all the important objects. And the prediction models tells you where the dynamic objects in the scene will move in the near future. And after understanding how everyone else will move, the planning models will then decide where the car itself should move to. And knowing where the car should move to, the control modules will then convert the plant trajectories into actual control signals that will turn the steering wheel and push the gas pedals, uh, namely to drive the car. I should note that this is just a canonical modeling stack. Actual implementation can vary widely. For example, one can merge some of these boxes into a bigger box letting one of these deep models handle multiple tasks. These models would get validated in um, both simulations and in closed off environments without public vehicles. Then the models would be released into a fleet of vehicles with safety drivers in them. These cars would then drive around town to collect data. Uh, a selection of the driving data would then be annotated by labelers um, to enrich the uh, existing labeled data set. And lastly, new models would be trained on the enriched data set to create better models. And these new models would again be validated and then to co collect data on the road and the cycle uh, repeats itself. The idea is that in each one of these development loop, the models will get better and better, handling more and more anonymous cases. And the key to making the model better and handling these anonymous cases is to collect more and more of anomaly data. And that's when anomaly detection comes in. We already saw that most of the driving data would be normal. We do, we do not want to collect um, the data at the peak of that long tail distribution. What we want to collect is the data at the long tail itself. If we have anomaly detection that helps us identify the long tail data points, then the data selection process will happen smoothly without much human intervention. That's the main reason why anonymity detection is crucial for the development of self-driving vehicles. Now that we've established the need for anonymity detection and where it fits into the development loop of self-driving cars, let's take a look at the different types of anomalies one may want to capture. The first type is anomaly by disagreement. One example of that is when the car is driving itself, but the safety driver in the car all of a sudden feels unsafe and takes over. There, we know something wrong must have happened to the autonomous function's decisions. A second example is when the human driver is driving, but the deep models are making inference at the same time in the background and comparing the output to the human driver's actions. We call this mode of testing shadow mode. Um, there, 
if the deep learning outputs differ significantly from a human driver's actions, that's also a disagreement. And the associated data would be collected as well. This type of anomaly, um, anomaly by disagreement, is quite self-explanatory. We won't go much into detail. The second type of anomaly is based on novelty. This focuses on scenes, roads, geometries, um, objects or maneuvers that are rare in nature and should be recorded to enrich the training data set when we encounter them. We will give a couple of examples of deep learning strategies that capture these novelties. And the third type of anomaly is based on uncertainty. They are ways to capture uncertainty of the model outputs. When the output uncertainty is high, even if the outputs are correct, the input data should be collected. This way, we can train more certain, more robust models over time. We will show a couple of examples of neural networks that capture uncertainties um, as well. So here is a first example of how deep learning strategies can capture anomalies that are based on novelty. This is a paper from the Volkswagen Group where they focus on novelties in images captured by dashboard cameras in the car. The idea is to greatly reduce the uh, input image dimension by mapping each one of the image to a latent space that is small enough for us to faithfully apply one class SVN in training, most normal data is used. So the algorithm will figure out where the boundaries are for the normal data. In testing, if um, we encounter some anomaly examples or scenes that the car has never seen in training, then we know which, uh, it would be mapped to somewhere outside of the boundaries of normal data. The dimension reduction methods used in this paper are first uh, convolutional autoencoders where the bottleneck layer is extracted and then followed by principal component analysis. Uh, in practice, the number of PCA components and SVM kernel parameters are tuned for optimal performance. So this is an example where novelty in the space of stationary image data collected during driving can be captured. This strategy does not consider novel dynamics in driving scenarios such as unexpected movements or risky behavior of other vehicles on the road. Uh, the second example of novelty detection is a strategy that is targeted at exactly what the first strategy is missing. Um, motion novelty or dynamic novelty. The strategy here is to first train a video prediction model named PredNet uh, on normal data that takes past images, image frames of a video to predict the image frame at a future instant. Uh, for example, uh, at each time instance t, this algorithm could use a couple of hundred images right before t to capture the image, uh, to predict the image at say t plus five frames. Then you can compare the uh, prediction uh, to the ground truth image you will actually collect. With that, you can use the reconstruction error between the prediction and the ground truth to determine if there are anonymous motions in the scene. Here, um, in the first column on the right, you see the ground truth image um, at T plus five and T plus six frames. And on the right, you see the prediction of the PredNet uh, generated at time equals to T. Um, you can see that the model uh, mostly did okay it produced pretty decent reconstructions of uh, many of the cars uh, ahead of you and uh, 
uh, in the other lane. However, it made this person on the motorcycle quite blurry. And that's actually a good thing. In this scene, the person on the motorcycle was actually speeding fast and cutting into your name, which is a very dangerous maneuver. The fact that the model gave it bad reconstruction means that they actually could identify it, uh, its motion as an anomaly. Um, so just to reinforce the formulation we've been showing you, the mapping function here is a neural network that maps fast, uh, past images frames to a future image frame. And the anomaly score is from the reconstruction error. Um, the last two examples I just showed you both had to do with anomalies based on uh, novelty. Now we switch gears to look at another type of anomaly, which is anomaly based on uncertainty. Uh, there are models and techniques that can capture uncertainties of the models. Uh, the most well-known way to do that would be um, Bayesian neural networks. This class of models would output a result while telling you how confident it is about the output. The example on the left is from a semantic, uh, sorry, uh, semantic segmentation model. Semantic segmentation is used as part of the perception module in the autonomous vehicle. Um, the middle column here shows you um, the segmentation output of the images on the left. So each color in the middle column here indicates an object class, uh, such as cars, signs, road, pedestrian walkway. Um, for example, all pixels that belong to uh, the cars uh, are labeled the same color. So as you can tell, this perception module is quite safety critical. We definitely don't want the network to get things wrong here, such as labeling uh, the pedestrian walkway as um, part of the road that a car can drive to. So knowing how confident the network is about its own prediction would definitely help with building better models. Um, the third column here shows that information, like how confident the model is on each pixel. Um, so each pixel here indicates the uncertainty level of the classification in the second column. Lighter colors means more uncertain. Uh, you can see that in the bottom row, um, the network seems quite uncertain about the classification uh, around where the uh, around the uh, pedestrian walkway here, okay? Uh, it's it very likely could not decide where the road ends and where the pedestrian walkway starts. If we collect more of such data that the model is uncertain about, well, we can use them to train more and more robust models over time. And that's why this type of data is important to us. Uh, similarly, the example on the right uh, depicts a model that can output uncertainty as well. The model here is tasked to output steering angles as part of the uh, planning module I, was, I mentioned um, as part of the autonomous modeling stack. Uh, it does pretty well on the first case here uh, where the steering angle is correct and the uncertainty is pretty small. Uh, it does poorly on the second case, uh, where both the prediction and the uncertainty uh, are unacceptable. Uh, you can probably deduce from the image uh, that the network is confused by the big shadow um, in front of the car. We know that even if the prediction here is correct, uh, we will still want to collect this data for the reason that the uncertainty is high. Uh, because we want future models to have both higher accuracy and higher uncertainty. All right, that's all for the case study of self-driving car development. I'm going to talk to you about anomaly detection models we develop 
Ellington. So, Ellington, all anomaly detection efforts on time series involve a platform we called Third Eye. Third Eye is a generic match monitoring platform we have set up here at LinkedIn. It aims to identify anomalies in metrics to minimize negative business impact. And it also provides explanations and investigative tools so that people can get to the root cause of anomalies when they happen. The platform is designed to be fully self-serviced. Here's a typical workflow. First, a data-driven algorithm identifies an anomaly in one of the metrics. The platform sends an alert to engineers responsible for monitoring that metric. Second, the responsible engineers can go on the platform and label whether the anomaly just identified was a true anomaly or not. If it looks like a true anomaly to the engineers, they can then use the anomaly investigation tool we did provide to uh, search for the root cause. Uh, if the engineers were not exactly sure if the anomaly was true or not, they can also use this investigation tool to help them decide. So what are the typical use cases for this third eye platform at LinkedIn? So basically, any team monitoring any time series data can use it. Uh, from the product team side, uh, examples include the anti-abuse team using it to monitor malicious access attempts, uh, the growth team using it to monitor connection requests and member signups, uh, the ads team uh, using it to monitor ad impressions, click counts and revenue, um, different AI teams can use it to monitor metrics related to model health such as model latency and error rate, and then business analytics teams uh, can use it to explain changes to business metrics. Uh, on the side of service teams, uh, the site real reliability engineers could use Third Eye to monitor metrics such as page load speed and uh, queries per second for database assets. Uh, in total, we have more than 50 teams across different organizations at LinkedIn, leveraging Third Eye for their metric monitoring needs. And the total number of time series that are being monitored is greater than 100,000. So that was a quick overview of the Third Eye platform. I mentioned that automated anomaly detection was a main benefit of the platform. So now I'm going to discuss the models we use for anomaly detection and how we evaluate these models. As you may have suspected, we have developed deep learning models for anomaly detection on time series, and we're serving these models on the third eye platform. We were not serving the models from day one though. Um, originally, we had a lot of traditional statistical models for that task. Um, they were working fine. Uh, there were a lot of benefits in using statistical models namely they are very lightweight, they're easy to train and easy to serve. And for many time series that are stable and exhibit strong seasonal patterns, these models worked well for the most part. However, um, there are also definitely disadvantages in using these models. The most noticeable drawback for us was that we did get a lot of complaints about false positive false positives, false alerts. These models would send out a lot of anomaly alerts that would trigger engineers to go to the third platform to inspect these alerts, only to find out that there were false alarms. Um, the second major disadvantage of these models is that they cannot handle irregular metrics well. Um, mm -hmm. So these are time series that do not show strong seasonal patterns. Uh, we did not have much luck applying you know, statistical models on such time series. So the disadvantage of statistical models I just mentioned will give off hints to why we decide to develop deep learning model solutions, right? Um, 
just to reinforce these ideas again, deep learning models could take care of drawbacks in the statistical models by um, being robust against different types of nonlinearities and help expand metric types to include uh, these irregular metrics. In the next few slides, I will give you a quick rundown of the current model workflow. Um, so at each time point, we will get the time series stream and it's associated historical anomalies as the model input. Um, we first, the first step after gathering these data is to perform data pre-processing um, so that we can feed clean relevant data into the downstream tasks. Uh, data pre-processing include modules such as data range selection and time series normalization. Um, these are pretty standard stuff, so I won't go into detail. Um, we also perform missing data imputation. That is, if we see that we are missing some data points in our selected time range, we will fill them in with uh, one of our imputation methods. We will also do the same for, histor for historical anomalies. That is, for all the data points in our selected range that we know were anonymous, we would then also impute normal values for them. This way, we will only have normal clean data as our input in subsequent model training or inference tasks. Uh, we certainly do not want uh, anomaly data as a part of our input uh, to cloud the judgment of our models. Um, next is feature preparation. Uh, which is to prepare the input features for deep learning models. Um, this step is model specific. For example, uh, if we want to build a MLP model to predict the time series values at a certain, at, at the current time, current time T, we can certainly use the whole uh, history of time series after a certain historical time point. Um, but a more lightweight and uh, likely smarter way to do it is to select specific historical windows in the time series that share similar timing attributes as the, certain, as the current time. In this particular example shown here, six of these two hour windows are selected. Um, and the six windows are centered at um, T minus one day, T minus two day, T minus three day, T minus one week, T minus two week, T minus three week time points. Additionally, we can add features encoding seasonality, um, such as one high encoding vectors for day of the week and hour of the day. Um, after having uh, input features, we're ready to use them in a model. The plot here depicts uh, the plot here depicts an MLP model where all time series data and seasonality vector are concatenated into a long input vector, and all network layers are fully connected layers. Um, this is a very rudimentary network, and an obvious drawback here is that the number of parameters is quite big. Uh, I could tell you though, in practice, this model actually worked quite decently. Uh, it definitely exceeded our expectations as the first deep model we tested on. Alternatively, uh, we will use a CNN model structure where the uh, historical windows um, are stacked up um, as different input data channels, uh, then we can use uh, a couple of uh, one-dimensional convolution layers to extract um, some features from this time series. Uh, then we can flatten these features and concatenate them with uh, seasonality encodings. Um, then we use fully connected layers for regression. Um, the CNN network structure greatly reduced the number of parameters from 30,000 in the MLP case 
to just below 2000. So let's take a look at another type of uh, structure. This is an autoencoder model using RSTM layers for both the encoder and the decoder. Here we will, like, we will let the network reconstruct the input time series period instead of performing um, time series prediction. As you know by now, uh, prediction models and uh, reconstruction models we just saw uh, are two common classes of mapping functions, uh, which is the first phase in anomaly detection. Uh, and the second phase is to find out the anomaly scores and actually call out anomalies. We developed a few schemes to calculate the anomaly scores. One simple way is to use the historical prediction error or reconstruction errors on normal data to construct a confidence interval of these errors when the data is normal. Then when we see an error that is out of the confidence interval, uh, we can call that data point an anomaly. Uh, we have also devised more dynamic thresholding scheme for calling out what errors count as an anomaly, which puts more weight on recent uh, error values uh, rather than error values that are more distant in the past. We also have developed models that output some uh, natural anomaly scores along with its output. Its output. Such uh, models include the ones trained with uh, deep quantile loss functions so that you can get a confidence interval with the model output. Also, we have mentioned models such as variational autoencoder and Bayesian neural networks where you can obtain a distribution of outputs uh, so that you can easily calculate a satisfactory, uh, a statistically sound anomaly score. Lastly, we have some post-processing modules. These are mainly here for the purpose of improving user experience. Um, for example, if our model detects multiple anomalies on the same time series uh, in close succession, we will merge these anomalies into one so that the system does not send multiple alerts to the engineers on call. Another example is that we allow users to set hard-coded rules for filtering some anomalies detected by the model. For example, even if a deep learning model detects something like a small bump in the data as a real anomaly, um, the team monitoring that metric could have, a, could have set a rule that says, oh, if the detecting anomaly is not, say, more than 10% deviation from the week-over-week -week data, then we don't really care, and we don't want to call that anomaly. Um, this way, we give more power and freedom to the users in terms of what kind of anomalies they will actually want to see or want to get alerts about. So that was the whole algorithm workflow. How do we actually evaluate these models? Uh, the baseline that we compare these models to would definitely be the statistical models we developed before any of the, these, these deep models. I mentioned that there were several issues with the statistical models, so we will certainly hope that the deep models uh, perform much better. The evaluation metrics include MAPE, which is mean absolute percentage error on normal periods um, for either prediction tasks or reconstruction tasks. Uh, and of course, we care most about precision and recall for anomaly classification itself. Note that we look at both instance precision recall and duration precision recall. Uh, instance precision recall has to do with how many true or false anomalies we detected when you ignore the duration of each anomaly. And duration precision recall has to do with how much overlap in the time space our detected anomalies have with the ground truth. Here are the results. 
there are a lot of numbers here. I won't go into much details here. Instead, I will just point out a few main takeaways we have. First of all, um, deep models um, performed much better than the baseline models on time series with and without strong seasonal patterns. Um, so this is definitely uh, quite reassuring for us. And uh, secondly, uh, we found that CNN models are much better than NLP models uh, for metrics that exhibit strong seasonal patterns, even though CNN models have much smaller parameter space. Um, lastly, we found that uh, autoencoders can better capture metrics characteristics for irregular metrics. However, uh, it does not work as well um, when it's directly applied for um, seasonal metrics. Uh, this may have to do, uh, this could improve uh, with better uh, feature or data pre-processing um, and that's ongoing work. All right, that's the end of the two case studies on using anomaly detection in industry one for autonomous vehicle development and one for time series anomaly detection at LinkedIn. I hope that was useful to you guys, especially those of you in academia who are curious about how these algorithms are used in industry. Next, I will hand it to Yan Rong. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so now the floor is open to Q&A. So Sam can take the questions. Sure. I see, yeah. Yeah, we have a question. Do you have strong label data over time to be able to understand improvements in metric like duration and precision? Uh, uh, so we do have strong labels for um, select metrics. We are working with a small number of teams right now to uh, focus on uh, a small number of uh, uh, time series that we really want to get high quality labels from. And uh, we are targeting uh, training good models on those particular metrics right now. And uh, later on, we're going to scale it up. Um, and um, anybody else from the team want to chime in here? Um, seeing none, I'll go to the next question. Uh, third eye allows anomaly detection of multivariate time series or only on univariate time series. Um, uh, Rowan, you wanna take that one? Sure, uh, so the third eye platform uh, actually does the detection uh, of the time series one by one in real time. So currently on production, we cannot really do a true multivariate detection where we uh, input uh, multi-dimension data into one model. Um, however, uh, we do have a model that is trained where it could serve multiple time series. Um, so, uh, and for each application after, um, after detecting the anomalies for the time series one by one, we do have a grouper uh, that can group uh, different dimensions and you can do dimension drill down to look at the dimension that has the highest anomaly uh, for root cause analysis. Okay, the next question from Rory. Um, rather than stacking different shifted time windows, have you tried networks that integrate time dependence? Uh, for example, temporal convolution. Yeah, um, that's a good question. We have not tried that approach, mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, uh, I, oh, wait, I think that's related to CNN, right? The CNN yeah, is well, a I time... Think it's like particular temporal convolution is a particular type of convolution that uh, Rory is talking about. Mm -hmm. um, um, I can clarify. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was just talking about during the feature creation, um, the, you talked about stacking shifted timeframes. And so, yeah, there's, there's a couple papers on doing temporal convolutions, not different, different from like visual from image convolutions, mm -hmm. um, but creating convolutions on the time series itself to try to extract time series features rather than having to manually shift the timeframes. Yeah, um, I mean, we do convolution a neural network by, um, by, by treating different 
windows as different channels and then use like one dimensional convolution, comp1D. Uh, I think the papers we were talking about specifically, we have not uh, adopted their methods yet. Um, but thanks for the suggestion though. Thank you. Uh, the next question, which statistical models do you use as a uh, baseline? So we have, uh, we have a few statistical models that we have tried actually for minute level and hourly level and daily level data, we use different types of statistical models and um, they uh, include spine-based models, ARIMA and- uh, um, um, And decayed mean, yeah. And yeah, um, yeah this, since this talk is focused on deep learning models, we haven't, uh, we haven't included them in, in this talk, um, um, but uh, and we're not actively um, researching them right now either. Um, yeah. The third I provided the lower bound and upper bound was the approach for computing the lower bound and upper bound basing approach. Um, so Bayesian approach is certainly one way, and also a uh, variational autoencoder uh, also provides a natural lower bound and upper bound. Um, but other than that, we have some uh, more rule-based approach, such as uh, uh, there was a paper from NASA that uh, does dynamic thresholding. Um, essentially, you use, uh, say, recent uh, data and their prediction errors to create a, uh, and fit a Gaussian model on top of that to create some lower bound and upper bound. Uh, and we have looked into a, a few of these, uh, more, uh, rule-based ad hoc methods. Um, mm. and we also have a quantile based deep model that would estimate the quantiles to, to get the upper and lower bound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are uh, several methods. Okay, I think we're running out of time, right? Yeah, uh, maybe we, we answer the last question. Would you be able to give more idea about how we can do root cause analysis for multivariate time series? Oh, that's a totally uh, different topic. So we can talk about it more in detail later, uh, but we probably don't have time to, to talk it now. Uh, so let's go to the next. Thanks. Oh, th thanks, Sam, for the Q&A. Sam? Hi, everyone. I'm Yen, and I'm going to talk about the distributed systems that we have built a linking for detecting the anomalies in time series data or matrix. This system is called Third Eye. This figure shows the high-level architecture and the workflow of this system. In this presentation, we will divide this system into two major components data ingestion and the detection core. The data ingestion components in charge of converting the tricking events that are emitted from other systems to time series data or matrix. These components also stores contextual events such as holidays, deployment events, A-B test events, or the, the previously detected anomalies, uh, which can be used to process the time series data uh, or used to generate the insights for root cause analysis regarding the detected anomalies. Okay, now let's dive into the detail of the data ingestion component. First, we look at the ingestion for time series data. As mentioned before, the data point of a time series is converted from uh, the tracking events that are emitted from other systems, such as the click number of a page, the CPU usage of a machine, or the prediction performance of a linking machine learning model. Uh, these tracking events are transmitted via Kafka which is a distributed uh, stream platform that can be used to publish and subscribe to real-time messages. In our use case, these messages are the tracking events. Uh, these tracking events will be converted to time series data by two types of computational pipelines, SEMSA over uh, the Hadoop and the Spark. SEMSA is a distributed stream uh, processing computation framework that can achieve real-time processing, which is very good for computing the data points of a time series at the minute granularity. 
Both Samsung and Kafka are open source systems that are previously developed by Linking and are currently hosted by the Apache Software Foundation. Although SAMHSA is able to process a finer granularity of data points, we don't suggest uh, to going finer than minutes granularity. The reason is that messages in large distributed systems can easily be delayed. Uh, consequently, the time series uh, that have finer granularity are very likely to be unstable. For example, let's say we have a time series in second granularity and assume that the tracking events can uh, the, that are immediate from the other system uh, or immediate around the same time can be delayed by 0 to 10 seconds then the value of the last 10 data points uh, will keep being updated by messages that uh, they did not arrive in time those their values could go up and down and very unstable in reality messages can be delayed for minutes or even hours depending on the complexity of the source systems. The other data processing pipeline uh, is done in batches, uh, that is, in offline Hadoop or Spark processes. This pipeline uh, is commonly used to generate hourly or daily time series. Combining both processing pipeline uh, we are able to generate more than uh, 100k metrics in different granularities uh, daily at linking. We mainly use two types of uh, data storage for time series data in graphs and uh, Pino. In graph is a distributed time series database that is widely used uh, at linking for checking real time metrics in minutes granularity. However, Engrave alone is not enough for supporting more complex anomaly detection applications, in which we might want to aggregate multiple metrics into one super matrix. For example, the page view of each country uh, tends to fluctuate. Those uh, we may aggregate metrics from all countries and run anomaly detection on this top metric. When an anomaly is detected, uh, we also want the ability to drill down by countries and then find out which country may have uh, the root cause, uh, maybe the root cause of this anomaly. Those we also use Pino, which is a distributed or lab uh, database, as one of our time series database. Pino is another open source system that is developed by linking and now is also hosted by the Apache Foundation. Uh, it uses a novel technique called Star Tree Index to speed up the aggregation and drill down processes on the data. Thus, we can easily detect anomaly in hourly granularity by reusing the time series in minutes uh, granularity. Or we can break down a top level uh, matrix to smaller matrix and then detect anomalies in both coarse grained or fine grained metrics. Besides the above mentioned data storage, our system uh, is also able to also has the adapters uh, for the popular MySQL database or uh, uh, the support for the Presto is, uh, is also on the roadmap. Other than time series data, contextual data is another important set of data in our anomalization system. Contextual data includes, but not limited to, holidays, system deployment, A-B test uh, events, labels, or the historical anomalies. The idea is to leverage the relevant events to improve the detection quality or generate useful insights when an alert is sent to the users. For example, if we detect an anomaly on July 4th, uh, the alert email will also show that the anomaly is properly induced by the current U.S. holiday. The labels from user can be used to refine the models uh, that are used in the systems. Finally, we use a simple database such as MySQL for storing contextual events since this part of uh, data growth is much slower than the time series data. Except for the trained models, uh, which are stored on HDFS in order to be uh, distributed to different uh, detection workers. Uh, 
more details uh, regarding model deployment will be discussed later. We next talk about the anomaly detection components. In this presentation, we'll focus on these three most important flows in our system. Offline model development flow, uh, online model submit flow, and the alerting flow. The offline model develop, uh, development or training flow only happens on developer's local machine or linking's model training cluster. The online submit flow is mainly run by detection workers. However, model developers can run it on local machine for debugging purposes. The alerting and the feedback flow is only run by those uh, detection workers. The purpose of this flow is to send out the emails uh, to the current Anko engineers and then collect the feedbacks or the labels from them. It also provides a link to redirect the users back to the root cause analysis UI, which can be uh, which will be discussed later by TA. We now discuss the detail of the offline training and online serving flow. These two flows follow the same architecture in order to minimize the inconsistency between them. This architecture has four components, a controller, which is the entry point of uh, each workflow. Uh, and this is also a bridge between the, uh, each workflow and the, the input data. Uh, a controller can be triggered by detection workers or the model developers uh, in a local machine. A workflow is uh, directed a cyclic graph or a deck uh, for simplicity, in which each node is a logic block. And the modules are the implementation for those logic blocks. The input of workflows includes time series, contextual events, trend model, and the configuration for this detection or uh, this model. This page shows the deck of offline training and online serving workflow. As can be seen, each rectangle is a predefined logic block, and model developers or uh, the users of this anomaly system can drop in the actual implementation to construct the concrete workflow. Now let's first focus on the left part of this figure. This part of workflow loads uh, the data, processes it, and covers it to feature for models. There are two common used uh, loading patterns uh, at the linking. The seasonal time series uh, loader retrieve data that is located in the current detection time window, and also the data uh, one to n weeks before current uh, window. This loader is used uh, usually used for refined time series. Uh, the continuous loader retrieves the entire time series uh, without breaking it into segments, which is mainly used for time series uh, with coarse grained granularity. The preprocessing module provides method to remove anomalous regions, which is defined by previous uh, previously detected anomalies or holidays, and uh, also provides a method to impute missing data or remove outliers. The feature generation module provides a method to convert data points of time series to different forms of features or tensors that can be concerned by our deep, deep learning models. Let's but not least, uh, we make sure these two flows are consistent with each other, even though the uh, offline flow is implemented in Java. Oh, sorry, uh, the offline flow is implemented in Python, and the online serving flow is implemented in Java for performance consideration. To achieve consistency, we always uh, implement modules in Java, which can, uh, can be triggered by a Java for Python invoker in the Python flow. Thus, we ensure these two flow are processed by the same implementations. However, we still leave some room for Python prototyping uh, in case we need to explore new methods. In this system, uh, we support two kinds of models statistical models and TensorFlow deep models. The TensorFlow model are trained offline on a, lo uh, on a linking cluster or a local machine. After training, the, uh, the developer can deploy it uh, to a path on HDFS uh, in order to distribute the model across all the detection workers. On the other hand, 
uh, the statistical model can be trained offline or even in line with the serving flow due to its simplicity. The advantage of training a statistical model during serving is that we don't need to set uh, the parameters of this model, uh, but only need, uh, only need to store the training configurations, uh, which can be determined in offline experiments. Those is easy to onboard a detection with a statistical model. Uh, and there are the common start points for most of our use cases. And later, user can switch to the models for better results when the models are well trained on the offline cluster. There are two ways of the model serving, uh, Python serving or Java binding serving. Python serving is natively supported by TensorFlow and provides the most complete APIs. However, most enterprise applications are implemented in Java for better performance. Uh, those linking has implemented a Java binding solution uh, that can interface with the C++ TensorFlow uh, implementation via Java. Here shows the model deployment flow of our anomaly detection system. First, we train the model on the developer's local machine or on a linking training cluster. If the model performs well after the evaluation, uh, it can be published via a logical disk manager, which uses HDFS as the physical disk in our system. This logical disk manager also provides a versioning of models and those we can roll back to previous version in case of uh, a faulty model. During serving, each detection worker can cache the latest model on the HDFS and trigger the inference via Java binding. Okay. Uh, finally, we will work through a complete anomaly detection flow of our uh, system. First, the tracking events are transmitted via Kafka and processed by streaming or batched metric pipeline. The time series data is stored on Pino or in graphs. The time contextual data such as holidays will be pushed to the MySQL server. Second, the model developer can use the offline training workflow to retrieve time series and the contextual data from the databases. After training the model, the developer will push it to the HDFS via linking logical disk manager. And during an online detection or online serving, each detection worker will pull in and cache the latest model in its logic disk and uh, in memory. The detected anomalies will be added to the contextual database or merged back with uh, the previously detected anomalies. Finally, the early alerting pipeline will send out emails in order to inform the current on-call engineers who can click the link in the email to go back to the UI and then provide the labels. Also, they can trigger the root cause analysis in order to identify the potential issues that induce this anomaly. In the next section, they will give more details regarding the UI of this system and the alert configuration. Thank you. Thanks, Yan. Uh, so now it's time for Q&A. There are two questions here. Uh, let me see. Uh, so there's one question about the duration of uh, precision recall calculation. Uh, is in the overlap area a period value? Do you label them by overlapping thresholds? Uh, I think, uh, Roy, can you take this question? Uh, yeah, uh, which questions are which? Uh, so currently there are two questions. The first one is how was the duration position recall calculated? Is in the overlapping area a period value? Do you label them by uh, overlapping threshold? Uh, so usually user would label us, um, for example, for the online ser served models, uh, we would send out an anomaly and tell the user, okay, this is the start and end of, the, of your anomaly and or the user can report any missing anomalies by specifying the start and, and the end. 
Um, so we do have labels that also have the start and end information. Uh, and when we train a new model, uh, when we detect its uh, interval anomaly, uh, there are two ways where we can determine whether it overlaps with uh, the, the labels. Either it's, uh, it, it is very rare that it could have 100% overlap. So that's why we thought of the, this duration overlap would be useful to tell us how much you overlap with what the user uh, gave you as label. So that's why we distinguish between the two. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the next question is, uh, when the detection is on user label, do you train one model per user? Uh, given the number of users linking has, there will be many small models. Do you preload those uh, small model in memory during prediction? Otherwise, loading into model for each user might cause overhead during prediction. So uh, that depends on the use case. Uh, for example, uh, the user could be a team and usually a team, uh, they might generate the same pattern of uh, metric. Then in that case, we can uh, detect the anomaly using one model. So basically, uh, usually we train the model depending on the pattern of their metric. And those, the number for each team could be different. Uh, from team to team, uh, but usually I, I can also uh, add it here. So for third eye, right, it is not uh, doing detection on the user level. If you're talking about user level detection, that's maybe uh, uh, fake accounts or uh, anti abuse use cases. For that use case, they will usually have a big model. But for uh, the time series use case on third eye, um, we're mostly looking at the time series metrics which is aggregating over the users or aggregating over uh, some time period. So there are kind of different use cases. I uh, hope that can clarify the questions. Yeah. Okay, okay. The next question. So yeah. The next yeah. question is, do you preload those small models in memory during predictions? Uh, that depends on uh, what's the what's current model. Usually for statistical model, uh, we will load them and train them on, on uh, during serving uh, because those models are pretty small, so uh, we don't put, keep them in the memory. But for deep models, uh, they are they are usually larger than the state scale model. So what we do is we will cache some of the uh, commonly used deep model in memory, and then uh, next time when we need to trigger the prediction, uh, we don't need to load the model again and that will remove the, the model that is least used in the uh, in final system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question is, uh, what sort of framework do you use for deploying models? Uh, something okay. like a microservice model is, is the part of a large piece of software. Uh, so the framework, uh, we didn't use any particular framework for deploying the models. Uh, the way we do is uh, we create a we create a distributed data storage uh, so we can uh, put our model on it and all the detection workers can talk to the distributed data storage and retrieve the model and each of the worker can uh, trigger the inference of the model uh, on them so uh, this is basically our, the, the way of our model deployment. Yeah, I think time is up. Maybe we can take one more question. Uh, how, to, how do you make sure the labels provided by users are accurate? What will you do if, if the labels are incorrect? Uh, if the labels are noisy, we would ask the user to relabel them, basically. Yeah. Um, so then thanks, Yan, for the Q&A. Uh, let's go to the next section. Thanks, Yan. Uh, my name is Tia, and the next, I'm going to talk a little bit about productive anomaly detection at LinkedIn. As a quick recap, we have been talked about generic use cases that LinkedIn pro product team can leverage so that <clears throat> for anomaly detection. For example, the methods can be used for business metrics using alerting, product, operation time series alerting and, and can also be used 
to detect abnormal model behavior. Right now, over 3,000 alerts and more than 100,000 time series data are being monitored on daily, hourly, or even minute granularity on SODAI services. Looking at this scale of anomaly detection, productivity becomes super important for the success of anomaly detection service. We need to consider the productivity in terms of how to onboard the user easily onto SODAI. The productivity in terms of how to support alerting and the notification in a more user-friendly way. The productivity in terms of how to identify the root cause for a quick fix in a more timely manner. More specifically, we have been focusing on the following three areas. Easy to use, easy to be notified, and easy for deep dive. Easy to use as the product for anomaly detection, users will be more motivated to use it if it's very easy to onboard their metrics and data. The process of onboarding new data is in a full self-served manner. Users just need to create an alert from SODAI UI and the defined simple YARMO configuration file. Basically, they only need to, speci to specify uh, data and metrics names, algorithm to use, and several simple algorithm and filtering parameters, and boom, it's good to go. The whole process does not take more than five or two, 10 minutes in most cases. If users want to play with the settings, so that also play, provides a preview functionality uh, so that they can take the different time windows and check how the performance of the algorithms. The second part is easy to be alerted. Here we meant two perspectives. One is for online learning models, as clients provide more label, we can apply auto-tune alert filtering to improve the performance of the alert for that particular metric. For the usability, uh, perspective, users can also specify how they want to be notified. They can specify multiple subscription group for a single alert, or they can also choose uh, to be alerted by groups of anomalies. The alert can then be sent via email, SMS, Slack, or uh, messenger or uh, phone once an uh, anomaly is detected. The third one, is easy for deep dive. Given the data with dimension signals, users can slide and dice to explore the root cause on the different dimension data. They can view how metric values change over time on a certain dimension by different measures. For high order dimensions drilled down, we have developed the root cause analysis algorithms to identify data cubes that are most anomalous and they rank the cube according to the data distributions. With the solution, so that I can automatically identify the potential root causes and be used, being used for the GC issue uh, for uh, uh, LinkedIn products. Now we come to the last part of this tutorial. In this section, I'm going to summarize this tutorial and share our thoughts on challenges and the future directions in this area. Let me start with a recap. For anomaly detection, the challenges are normally fall into the following categories. One, anomaly labels are sparse. Given the lack of labels, it's very challenging to apply many traditional uh, supervised learning algorithms to tackle this problem. And furthermore, the notion of anomaly is largely dependent on applications. So it's hard to apply an algorithm that fit to quite a few applications uh, due to these facts. Also, as time goes on, the data also evolve. It's likely that the previous defined anomaly may no longer hold for the recent data. In such case, the label may become noisy. 
In practice, the user labels are subjective and noisy to use. How to leverage this noisy label to find a solution is very challenging. As we said, data is complex and evolving. Normally, we need to learn normal data representation in this complexity and its challenging itself. The last but not least, to detect anomaly detection, right? So we need to learn the boundary between normal and abnormals. For the reasons we mentioned above, it is very challenging to learn a boundary that can well surprise, separate the normal versus abnormal data over time. In this tutorial, we have uh, talked about a variety of uh, deep learning anomaly detection algorithms and group them into the three sections. The first subsection is a, a building block. And in this section, we talked about some basic and but popular deep learning uh, models, such as MLP, CNN, uh, recurrent neural network, and one class type of uh, anomaly detection algorithms. In the section of popular deep learning uh, model uh, structures, we talked about autoencoder and also several uh, types of uh, gener generative models, such as the uh, variational autoencoder, GAN, and some of the flow-based algorithms as well. In anomaly detection with sparse labels subsection, we introduced semi-supervised learning and the transfer learning that can help us to improve the uh, model uh, performance. Those algorithms has been widely used to tackle the challenges that we mentioned uh, early. In application section, we talk about the case study of auto vehicle anomaly detection and put a lot of focus to introduce the anomaly detection at LinkedIn, particular how we have been leveraged uh, the deep learning methodology to tackle some hard problems of time series anomaly detection. We are going to post the slides later so that you can go through the section that is uh, particularly interesting to you. As deep learning algorithms for anomaly detection is core to this tutorial, in this page, uh, I summarize, we summarize the advantage of uh, different algorithms into this table. For MLP, the major advantage is that we can learn a nonlinear data representation from the normal data. And CN can be used to capture hidden spatial temporary structures from complex data. And RNN is, uh, is helpful to uh, capture the context information from sequence. For an uh, autoencoder, uh, we normally apply these algorithms to learn the robust data representation. Um, via the dimension reduction. The variation autoencoder, we use this methodology to learn continuous latent space. Anomaly score has a statistical, statistical meanings in this type of uh, algorithms. Again, it has been used to learn the semantic representation without prior assumption on a latent space distribution. And for the semi-supervised uh, learning, uh, right, we can find a compact description of data based on this uh, limited uh, set of label information. And the transfer learning is widely used for um, improving the model performance. So it can be used for data augmentation and fine tune from pre-trained model, right? So, and this is a, a quite a few common practice uh, within anomaly detection and other uh, applications in general. I do want to it reiterate that those algorithms I introduced here uh, does not necessarily work well immediately for your application. Some of the work is still in early exploration phase, but it's very innovative. The success of using the deep anomaly detection algorithms largely depends on the deep understanding of your problems, your data, and the production constraints. The key takeaway for algorithms is shown in this figure, which describes most uh, deep learning uh, detection algorithms scheme. 
uh, we summarize all these algorithms and put into these two learning um, two 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 parts. Right, the one part is uh, um, learning data representation, and the second part is the uh, detect anomaly. The whole process can be grouped into three steps. The first step is to define a mapping function that can map data to uh, unified space. The second part is a scoring function to measure anomaly in the unified space. And the last one is simply to learn a threshold value to determine if the data is anomaly or not as output of the first two. Algorithm alone does not fly, and we need a system to serve the anomaly detection capability. Here are several key takeaways. First one, in the system design and the, the time deliverable is, a, is something that we need to consider, consider at the same time. And the second, we also need to consider the trade-off, particularly between the model performance, the runtime serving cost, and also the model complexity. Sometimes it is a sort of comp compromise or trade-off in terms of how fast we can ship the solutions. In practice, it is usually good practice to start with a simple deep model first and use it to build your whole runtime workflow. Then you can roll out more complex deep models on top of it in a fast speed with multiple iterations. So the design consistency system for online and offline is also super important. And we don't want to, in many cases, we avoid to use the, uh, the, the different implementations across online offline for the similar functionality, which can introduce the issues and bugs easily. And as the large of a number of applications uh, call for the support of deep learning uh, anomaly detection, uh, algorithms, right? The scalability is another factor that we need to consider when we design the systems to serve those solutions. Next, I'm going to talk about the challenges and the future directions. We group the challenges into the following four areas. The first area is data. We mentioned a little bit about the data challenges at the beginning of this section and the beginning of this tutorial. And we want to reiterate the challenges of this data. Sim simply, this is a very core part, right? So it's a, the data availability for anomaly detection is hard problem. Anomaly is rare by nature and the labeling cost is high and noisy. But how to tackle this problem in a better way, we need innovative algorithms such as data augmentation, uh, better data representation and the capability to handle robust anomaly detection with noise uh, in label. The second part is model selection and parameter tuning. We need a more advanced algorithm, right? So normally the challenges is more kind of, we need a systematic learning to learn the parameter and to learn the best architecture of the deep model for the application. And still some open questions in terms of how to find the right parameters for some algorithms, such as how to find the degree of compression for autoencoder, how to find the degree of transferability for transfer learning, etc. We need innovative algorithms on learning best parameters and architecture of deep models in a very efficient way. Third part is a serving. As we mentioned earlier, serving the model for a large number of cl clients is very challenging, simply because deep learning model compared with many other models usually have a lot more consumption need for memory and also the, has an impact in terms of latency. So to scale up the deep learning uh, anomaly detection solution, we need innovative algorithms on model compression, uh, application level on anomaly detection, and also a more scalable platform to support the serving. The last but not the least important is model understanding. As the deep learning models behavior complexity goes up, right, so we need to understand and interpret 
the deep model behavior for anomaly detection. We need more innovative algorithms for model explainability and interpretability. It is going to be very critical for us to really understand the, especially if something goes wrong, and also needs to apply this uh, methodology to shed light in terms of the next iteration for the further improvement. In this page, we list out the partner teams and also some team members who has been uh, working together uh, on the anomaly detection, both from algorithms and the serving side. And uh, uh, we want to thank for them for the great co uh, collaboration. Thank you, everyone. And then I'm, we are ready to take some of the uh, questions. Thanks, Tia. Uh, and we can answer questions now. Uh, so I see one question on where I can find the recording. So this recording is available on the uh, HOVA app. Uh, I, I will share the link uh, later. And the recording for this Zoom will be available later. Uh, we don't know yet. We need to ask the KDD team uh, when this will be available. But it will be available at least after the conference. And I, I've seen several questions uh, uh, pasted in the chat, and uh, I, I think my team members have uh, uh, answered most of them. Uh, one thing I do want to bring up, uh, I think a couple of guys have asked, is more kind of considering the balance between the deep model uh, inference versus the, the performance of the model. So that's a very, very good question, especially when we think about how to ship deep learning model to production. Uh, one one thing is really uh, a sort of compromise between, but we are tackling this problem in an uncompromised way. What we did is that we sort of uh, start with a, a simple single time series anomaly detection, and we are we are working to uh, add it to expand the uh, the model that can be served to uh, for multiple uh, multiple uh, uh, time series right metrics. So by this type of algorithm innovation, it can help us to scale up the, uh, and reduce the serving cost of uh, uh, using a deep learning model for online uh, anomaly detection. Um, and then another factor is that when we consider the models to be served, we do our best to reduce the complexity of the models, but to still have the certain performance uh, guaranteed. And so that we can reach the the goal of using deep learning model to maximize the online performance metrics and still have the serving cost um, within a certain reasonable range of, uh, of response. Yeah, so that's a that's a that's an answer we can share. Uh, uh, hopefully, um, and I can take another question. I see we run out of time. Uh, question for each new customer of uh, Sodai. Usually, how many weeks does it take to get the new customers fully on board to the team can complete hands off? That's also a good question. And so uh, for the customers, by default, we are supporting a large number of uh, teams within LinkedIn, but they have the different requirement. Some teams really want to have a, uh, the metrics is simple, right? So, and it's, it's easier to detect. So for that case, we recommend to use the self onboarding process that can use the statistics models that we developed to help them uh, to do the anomaly detection. In some of the cases, we observe that uh, it's, uh, it's work, it works well, right? Because of the com uh, complexity of the problem for, uh, uh, for anomaly detection for their problem data uh, is, is very simple. Right? So, and the, for that use case, it's uh, almost the zero cost. Like I, I mentioned earlier in this uh, presentation session, right? and normally it's, you, as far as you, you, you read the document and you know how to set up the alerts, and it normally takes five to 10 minutes to onboard. Having said that, some of the metrics, especially some key business metrics and the key product metrics, the data is very complex. In that case, we need to work uh, multiple iterations with the teams. And so that we set up, normally we set up the goals, right? what is the performance in terms of MAPE, precision recall. And then we work together to collect the labels, to train the models and to ship online and to increase the scalability. So in that process, it takes a little bit longer time. Yeah, so uh, uh, Ruin, I don't think we have time to answer other questions. Uh, I will uh, hand it over back to you. Okay, uh, so thanks a lot everyone for posting your questions and for attending our session. Uh, so going forward, you can keep asking questions in the uh, HOVA app 
or the vFair, um, maybe Hova app is a better place to chat. And we will try our best to answer the questions. Um, thanks all. Thank you. Thanks all the comments. We really appreciate it. and thanks all the to all the presenters also. <laughs>